Good morning, everybody. That was not meant to be a call and response. The microphone wasn't working, but I appreciate <laughs> the uh, enthusiasm for the Board of Supervisors this morning. So we're just waiting for uh, this to get set up. I tried to put them on that many times. I know. There we got it. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying good morning back. Uh, we'd like to welcome everybody to the February 6th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Friend. Here. And just before we begin the moment of silence and Pledge of Allegiance, Supervisor Leopold wanted to uh, say something. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, as we take the moment of silence today, I hope you'll uh, all remember um, a, a very good community member, Larry Perland, who passed away uh, last week. Uh, Larry was chair of the Live Oak School Board. Uh, he was a member of the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County Board, um, formerly my planning commissioner, and just has been an outstanding advocate for Live Oak, um, uh, for uh, good uh, development, um, and for really taking care of the next generation of, of human beings that are gonna be living here. Uh, it was, it's a great loss to lose him so early in life, and uh, uh, please keep him, in, him and his family in your thoughts as we do this moment of silence. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Please join us in a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes or deletions or corrections to today's agenda? Uh, yes, on the consent agenda, uh, items uh, 9 and 11, there's an additional materials. There's CEQA uh, notice of exemptions for each of those items. On item 46, there's additional materials. There's an ADM 29 form. And on item 50, there's uh, a replacement of the AUD 74 uh, form. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Plasso. So we'll now uh, ask whether there are any more uh, members of the board that would like to either pull an item or briefly comment on an item of consent. Good morning, Supervisor Caput. Uh, th uh, thank you. I, I just want to say that uh, on item number 18, uh, a small uh, remodel on the uh, um, mental health facility in Watsonville. And uh, I think that uh, we need to do more, and uh, we are doing more for uh, mental health uh, uh, outreach in the Watsonville area, South County. So I'm really uh, pleased to see that. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Capper. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I will uh, be voting no on item number 11. Uh, and also, I just wanted to um, say thanks to all of the people who serve on the various commissions. We are accepting and filing reports on several of those commissions, water, women's, seniors, mobile and manufactured homes, in-home support services, and so forth. We have uh, literally hundreds of people serving on our two dozen plus uh, commissions in this county. They put a lot of time and effort into it, and without obviously going into each and every one of them, uh, they are a, a really tremendous asset for us, and uh, we appreciate the time and effort they put into these various um, these various efforts that they have. Uh, they're vital to each uh, of us on the Board of Supervisors, so I just wanted to say thank you to those who serve on those commissions. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, just a couple items to comment on. First is item number 17, which is a communications tower in Davenport. I wanna, uh, thank Information Services and the Sheriff's Department for working on getting this really vital piece of public safety equipment uh, up and, uh, and making sure our community and our deputies are safe. On item number 30, uh, which is a report, the annual report on the managed care uh, Med Medi-Cal program, which is the Central Coast Alliance for Health, and I'm the board's representative on that, um, to that organization, and I just wanna say, uh, if you haven't had a chance really understanding 
what a remarkable organization this is. Uh, it covers one quarter of the residents of Santa Cruz and half of those residents are children. Uh, they have been doing a great job in increasing the capacity to take uh, people who are new, uh, new into the into the healthcare system, uh, and now we're really moving towards a health-based system where we're giving grants to encourage people to, to be healthy before they end up touching the medical system, which is the direction we all wanna go, <laughs> and all of this in very uncertain times with uh, machinations at the federal level. Um, so uh, so I'm honored to be part of that organization and, uh, and, and recognize their good work. And then finally, on item number 43, which is a report on the Davenport water line, I just wanna take a moment and thank Public Works staff <laughs> This is, this is public service. We had a water line go out. A community was at, uh, under in jeopardy of going dry over the summer. They stepped in, they got the water line <coughs> replaced, they did it under budget, and then were able to uh, get a USDA grant to cover the entire cost so a low-income community didn't have to bear that burden. And um, so thank you to everyone who did who was involved in that project. It's important work and it's a great example of, of government service. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, I, too, will be voting no on item 11. Uh, I'd like to comment on item uh, number uh, 41, which is the follow-up to the special meeting uh, about the lost childhood exhibit. Um, it's pretty impressive when you read uh, this uh, report about all the, at all the things that happened as part of this uh, path-breaking ex exhibition. Uh, we were all moved by that when we met at the Museum of Art and History, uh, but to see all the different ways in which the community interacted with it, to see how it still has legs and it's, uh, we're looking at another exhibition, looking at immigrant children, uh, it really shows the power of working together both with the arts and history community, with uh, our human services department, um, with uh, uh, with uh, young people who've been in the foster care system. It was just an incredible uh, collaboration and I'm glad that we were part of it and I want to acknowledge the Human Services Department for their leadership role in making it happen. Um, it, it's really a great asset uh, for uh, the county. Um, on item number 44, which is the request for proposal for our illegal dumping uh, outreach and marketing campaign, this is also uh, critically important for our community um, it's uh, the problem of illegal dumping hasn't gone away and we need uh, to think creatively about how we're gonna work to stop this. This is one part of that, the public education part of it, and I look forward to the bids we'll get back. Uh, lastly, on item number 49, I appreciate that the Public Works Department um, is wor already working on elements of the rail trail um, or the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. I wanna encourage them to look beyond the ones that are already uh, uh, granted and continue to look for funding sources or help in funding other parts of this trail. This is a um, highly anticipated um, uh, 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 use of this corridor and we have to be thinking now in order to ensure that we can build this thing as quickly as possible. So I look forward to continue working with Public Works on that. That's it. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. I'll just briefly comment on one item, which is item 38. I just wanted to thank the Health Services Agency and, and Dientes uh, for their work on, uh, on receiving this education and treatment grant. I think it's a very important thing that we continue to highlight the need uh, for oral health access within our community, and I appreciate uh, how serious uh, the county and Dientes have been taking this <coughs> in the last couple of years to really get this outreach to even more of the affected populations. I'd like to open it up to the community. Is there anybody like to address us on an item on consent? Now would be your opportunity. Please, good morning, welcome. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Laura Marcus and I'm the CEO of Deanthus Community Dental Care. For 25 years, Deanthus has provided dental services and oral health education to members of our community who could otherwise not afford it. Starting with a small volunteer-based clinic on Mission Street in 1993, today Deanthas has three clinics, 65 staff, including 12 full-time dentists, and an outreach program serving over 35 locations countywide, with close to 11,000 patients served each year. To achieve this, after adding a pediatric wing in 2014 with county-supported CDBG funds, we're able to provide services to thousands of children and adults at our main clinic on Commercial Way. 
At a clinic owned by the county and operated by Deanthas in Watsonville since 2015, we provide services to close to 2,000 Watsonville residents. In 2016, Deanthas opened a one-chair clinic at Homeless Services Center and provides much-needed care once a week to adults and children experiencing homelessness. And finally, last year, Deanthas took over a vacated clinic in the Beach Flats neighborhood to provide services to those patients who were losing their providers when Salud Parla Gente closed that location. In addition to our clinics, Deanthas provides oral health education to thousands of children annually through our school outreach program. While at schools, we also provide dental care to children who don't have a dental home. We also serve patients at skilled nursing facilities and Head Start programs to meet the special needs of these populations. In 2016, with perhaps one of our most important projects, we published the Oral Health Needs Assessment for the Central Coast. With the support of multi-sector leaders, we developed a countywide oral health access strategic plan. Today, with the support of funding from Proposition 56 and continued leadership of steering committee members, including the County Health Services Agency, this plan will achieve increased access to education, prevention, and services to thousands more Santa Cruz County residents, as Zach just mentioned. Finally, we're embarking on exciting new plans with partners Mid-Pen Housing and Santa Cruz Community Health Centers to develop the county's Capitola Road property into an affordi affordable housing and health services hub for Live Oak residents. Deantas expects to serve an additional 7,000 people by the end of 2020. With successful with 25 years successfully serving Santa Cruz County residents, we've gained a great appreciation for the importance of partnerships and the support of local government. Thank you, each of you, as well as county staff, for recognizing the importance of access to dental care, supporting the growth and success of our organization over the years, and for our continued partnership as we work together to achieve the Oral Health Access 2020 goals. On behalf of my board of directors, our entire staff, and thousands of patients, we thank you for being a cornerstone of our success. Thank you, thank Ms. Marcos. You. Thank you for your ongoing work, your partnership, um, and your fierce commitment to serving uh, people in need in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was on item 38. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. I would like to pull item number 14, the whistleblower report. I, I find it interesting that department heads are invited to investigate their own departments that have been reported. And I would like to pull item number 17 because I think there's a conflict of interest with Supervisor Friend and Supervisor Coonerty in this, um, this issue. Can, is, are these necessary to pull or can you just speak to them now? Well, I'd like to pull them for further public discussion. Uh, what additional information do you need from the public that we couldn't get through commentary now, just so I understand the purpose of pulling the items? Um, well, I understood, first of all, that the public is allowed to do this to gain uh, a better uh, question and answer time that's not normally allowed during this time. I did do a lot of research yesterday on um, item number 17. The plans and specification for the tower were not available at general services, and it took me about an hour and a half to finally talk with Ms. Uh, Tibby McCann, who is the project, the project director, and I understand what's going on there, and I support um, communication for law enforcement, but I think okay. that you and Mr. Coonerty have conflict of interest, and I think that needs to be discussed. Okay, uh, we'll make item 1455.1 and item 1755.2. Thank you. I'd like to also uh, thank Supervisor Leopold for voting no on number 11. I support that. Uh, I don't think that um, hosted rentals should be limited and, and I, I just don't agree with this at all, so thank you. I would also like to point out that I would like to see more, uh, I would like to see an investigation regarding number 40, um, child trafficking in this state and in this country and in the world is, is abysmal. And I think that our, our county really needs to do an investigation into some of the foster care mm -hmm. and uh, really investigate that. And then finally, item number 49, I too am happy to see some work going on on the, um, the scenic trail. And I, I plan to walk the, the full 32 miles of that trail. And if anyone would like to join me, you're welcome. I'm not gonna do it all in one day, but I welcome anybody that would like to walk that trail with me and really take a look at the beautiful place and its challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address this on item on consent? Good morning. 
Good morning, Chairman, friends, supervisors. Just three things, but it'll be real quick. Uh, one is number 21. Um, I think you should uh, put a moratorium on all appointments to planning until you reenact the Citizens Planning Appeal Board. This was abolished by you. You, re you assumed all that authority so that you now only ma you make the law, you execute the law, and you judge the law. We just heard Bruce McPherson, um, who actually received thousands of dollars from a communist red Chinese triple agent and never mentioned in the Sentinel. Um, but anyway, uh, he just commented on the wonderful community volunteers, but it seems like for at least, at least a half a decade, you haven't found any contractors inside this county that you feel are good enough to be on the appeals board and you continue to hold that power to yourselves, I think, for uh, bad purposes. Uh, the other one is number 40. Uh, where you're, again, you're moving authority to a cog. A cog is a council of government. You're giving away the authority of this county and the sovereignty of the people here and their ability to control you, and you continually do it. You're operating under the uh, programs of which Bruce McPherson and uh, uh, Fred Keeley worked under, uh, which is Common Cause. It's a huge foundation-run thing in which they want to con consolidate uh, power in organizations like AMBAG in which there is no community TV, by the way, and there is no report by the Sentinel newspapers. And then lastly, uh, the tragedy of lost children. Uh, there were 500 arrests in Los Angeles. I suggest people look up Pizzagate. It's something, again, the Santa Cruz Sentinel that's controlled totally by globalists will never tell you about. So anybody else would like to address us on an item on consent, please, now would be your opportunity. Uh, seen no one else would like to it. Oh, it's all right on the consent agenda. Oh, no, sorry. It's on consent. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Lauren Benetua. I'm from the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. And I just wanted to say thank you to the Board of Supervisors for being involved in this process and being our partners in this exhibition. And I'm pleased to report some of the impacts and outcomes of the exhibition, which included over 70,000 visitors to the exhibition. And we engaged 130 community partners in this process from planning to the execution and the programming and events, 50% of, um, of whom were uh, foster youth or youth in care. Um, we also invited uh, museum visitors to take direct action and I'm pleased to say that this resulted in over three uh, in over 300 direct actions fulfilled to support foster youth um, I also want to say thank you especially to supervisor John Leopold for um, being involved as well and also opening up the opportunity for foster youth to speak directly to the Board of Supervisors. Um, and that conversation also sparked similar versions of that engagement um, with foster youth, which included the Santa Cruz County Office of Education superintendents. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanna say thank you so much for being our partners and we look forward to um, more collaboration in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's item 41. Thank Good morning. You. Welcome. Good morning. I'd also like to speak to item 41. Um, my name is Nina Simon. I'm the executive director of the MA. And Lauren just shared some of the great outcomes of the Lost Childhoods exhibition. For us at the MA, this was really an experiment to ask the question, could we use a museum exhibition to spark dialogue and direct social action on an issue that matters here in Santa Cruz County? And um, as you heard from the outcomes of this exhibition, we feel like the model is proven. We're very excited about it. Um, the, that specific exhibition, Lost Childhoods, just opened last week in Salinas with a new addition that relates to Monterey County uh, Youth and Care and Foster Youth many of whom are in a um, uh, underground or undocumented situation, and that exhibition may continue to go around the state in partnership with CASA, um, but we don't want to start with stop with that exhibition. Our intent is every other year to do a six-month exhibition at the MA on an issue of uh, 
direct local importance, using art as a catalyst for social dialogue and action. Um, and so what I'm here to say is we're proud of this project, but we're really looking to you as our partners in the future of being able to use museum exhibitions at the MA to have an open conversations about issues that matter in this room and throughout our county. And we're currently working with partners around the county to talk about what should the next project be in 2019, what else should we be looking at. Um, we'd certainly welcome any supervisor input on issues that you think would be really potent for this kind of uh, public investigation and exploration. And we're really excited about the opportunity to do this, not just at the MA, but at museums around the world. Uh, Lauren and I are working now on a toolkit for how other museums around the world can make these kinds of exhibitions. We've already had interest from a group who came over from England to see this foster youth exhibit and to think about how they could do a similar project. So we're really proud that here in Santa Cruz County, we're creating a model that can be used not just to open up dialogue around issues here in our community, but potentially in other communities as well. I think that from my perspective, the partnership with the county um, on this project was absolutely instrumental to its work, uh, especially our great partnership with the Human Services Department led by Ellen Timberlake and with supervisors. Um, the fact that youth got to speak directly to you at that study session was incredibly meaningful for them, and it was incredibly meaningful for all the advocates who've been working with foster youth for so long and feel that the issue often is seen as invisible. I'm really heartened and believe that action can happen based on that exhibition, and I'm excited and very curious to hear your perspectives on what other issues we could comparably spark action and dialogue around with an exhibition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your ongoing work to use the museum as this tool to, to engage the community in a critical uh, issue uh, is outstanding. It's un, it, it's, uh, it, it was unlikely uh, to, to see a museum play that role. And, and then the museum really stepped up and really engaged the community <coughs> in the creation of the, of the uh, exhibition and then really engaged the community in seeing the exhibition and participating. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Timberlake. Good morning, Supervisors, Chair Friend, Ellen Timberlake, Director of the Human Services Department. And I just wanted to conclude the discussion about lost childhoods with an enormous amount of appreciation to both your board for taking the step out into the community and listening to the voices of our, uh, of our foster youth and former foster youth, but also an incredible amount of thanks to Nina, Lauren, the Ma for inviting the community in to create this experiential exhibit and really to the youth who led this process. Um, I have never been a part of something as powerful as this. I am a true believer in the vision that Nina just shared. We will do everything possible to take this exhibit and make it work across the state, and we also will be an eager partner as you know, new issues come to the fore to use the museum and the community to really um, move, this, move this model forward. So I wanna thank um, everyone who's been involved. It's on behalf of our department. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else for a consent agenda? Good morning. Uh, morning. Uh, morning, whoops. Morning to my Santa Cruz County residents. It's just hard to multitask uh, with my GoPro. Um, but anyways, I want to be able to say that, you know, I'm running late, and I want members of the public to know that the Brown Act is a real act. W which item on the consent agenda are you addressing? Oh, well, I was, that's the whole thing. I was, I was trying to deal with that. The light item agenda, like I said, is in a secret room way back there. I'm running late. I need the light item agenda placed here. And I, I need members of the public to help me because we should be able to scrutinize it, peruse it right here so I can, I can be able to weigh in on the political issue. There's issues here, but I'm afraid if I go over there, I'm gonna miss my opportunity to do the consent calendar. I, we asked last week, if you guys can please put the public comment, where needs a, uh, the public uh, agenda, right out here so we can scrutinize it, peruse it, circumspect it. I think it's imperative for civil society activists to be able to come up here and do this. County Council, it doesn't benefit members of the public to put it over there. Is it, it is actually left right there. Are we out of copies on that desk? The, the light item agenda, so I, I'm, I'm able to peruse it the according the to the Brown agenda, Act? The entire agenda, including the consent agenda. The, the package. He wants the full, oh, wants oh, the full I see. binder. Yeah, yeah, the binder. I apologize, because it, 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 yeah. it's, it's hard for me to, to be able to weigh in on the issues. I wanna talk on the issues, but it's over there and I don't wanna miss it okay, here and I'm running a little late. We asked last week, uh, Becky asked for it also, 
and as a member of the public, we're asking for it to be kept in this room so that we're able to scrutinize it. So I can come and make a qualifying statement regarding the issues, but since I'm not, this is what I gotta do, is I gotta use the consent calendar to continue to, to raise protests, and that's the American way. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to address us on the, an item on the consent agenda? Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Marilyn Garrett, part of Wireless Radiation Alert Network, item 17. Item 17 has been pulled. Okay, I need to leave early, so I won't be able to stay to the end, I, so I, I need to comment I, now. I apologize, it's a pulled item, and it's a regular agenda item now, and so one of your, Ms. Steinbrenner pulled it for additional discussion later okay, on in the day, so we can't address it now. Okay. Uh, Unfortunately, it's, Item 55.2. Do you have a sense of what time that would be on in the afternoon? Well, we have a, we have a 1045 scheduled item and it will, it'll fall immediately after that 1045 scheduled item. Okay, I have to go. Well, I also wanna talk about uh, the uh, number uh, 14, the whistleblower. That, that, huh? item, that item was also pulled by Ms. Oh, Steinbrenner. Those, those two items were pulled by Ms. Steinbrenner. They'll both occur right after the 1045. 1045, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else I'd like to address us on consent? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring back to the board for action. I move the consent agenda as amended with the, the acknowledgement of the two no votes on item 11. Second. A motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll now move on to oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. You'll have three minutes uh, to address the board. Please feel free to step forward. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Kate Roberts with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. I'm the president of that organization. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, I wanted to speak to you about a white paper that MBEP recently published in partnership with Envision Housing. It's a white paper on what realistic policy changes could improve housing affordability in the Monterey Bay region. And I just wanted to make you aware of it, if you weren't already, that this paper um, includes nine policy recommendations that have been thoughtfully researched and tested in other locations throughout the state for their effect on improving housing affordability in highly constrained markets. Our region's current housing policies have had the effect of producing not only less supply, but when homes are built, they are typically large and not suited to today's workforce. These nine policy areas are designed to address increasing the supply of all housing types, subsidized affordable and market rate rentals, ADUs, lower priced for sale condos, and mid priced for sale homes. We are grateful for this board's efforts to date that have, for example, increased the supply of ADUs, but there is still a lot of work to do. We want to incent the right kind of houses to be built and implement sound policies that ensure our housing production continues to grow. That white paper can be found on our website, mbep.biz, and we would be happy to follow up with you and make sure that you get a copy of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. The entire board has received a copy okay. of that report. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Roberts. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. My name is Veronica Lopez Duran and I am currently the Community Studies Program Manager at UCSC and I am here today to invite you all to join us on Giving Day which will be February 28th to contribute to our particular campaign which will be honoring Officer Elizabeth Butler. Um, a little bit of background, I spent two and a half years working at the Regional 911 Center before m moving to work at UCSC, and I was actually on duty the day of the incident. And so I'll move forward with um, giving you a little bit more information about what in particular we're um, looking to do. So on February 28th, 2018, please join us, the Community Studies Program, in honoring, honoring alumna Elizabeth Butler, our class of 1996, whom we remember as Beth. Community Studies created the Elizabeth Butler Scholarship Fund to memorialize her all too brief life that ended tragically on February 26, 2013, while Beth was conducting a sexual assault investigation as a detective with the City of Santa Cruz Police Department, along with her colleague, Butch Baker. This Giving Day campaign joins campus and community together in the cause of honoring Elizabeth Butler's, Butler by enabling future students to follow her example. As part of her community studies major, Beth spent six months 
working with La Familia Center, contributing to its community development mission. The Elizabeth Butler Scholarship Fund is a tribute to her deep and abiding engagement with Santa Cruz as a student, community member, mother, and police officer. The fund supports an annual award, the Elizabeth Butler Scholarship, for community studies undergraduate students who follow in Beth's footsteps by pursuing academic study in Santa Cruz. Your generous contribution will allow the scholarship to become a permanent endowment sustaining her legacy long into the future. Uh, so I'm gonna leave you with more information here so you can share with your constituents, with people that follow you on Facebook, Twitter, whatever accounts you all hold. And um, lastly, this last year we had 10 students that were in the local Santa Cruz County community and contributed over 7,000 hours to those organizations. So we hope that you will join us in spreading the word. Thank you. Thank you. Simon, welcome. Hi, I'm Sibley Simon. I was uh, one of the main authors of the paper Kate just mentioned, and so I wanted to provide a little commentary and, and motivation for it, so I hope you get a chance to really look at it. The uh, thing that I was most encouraged by as I looked at what's going on around California is that there are some solutions to some of the difficult debates we get into, I think, or the, that turn out to be false debates. One is that we see the small amount of housing we produce in the unincorporated county here is generally two things, either some subsidized affordable housing or inclusionary housing units and large expensive for sale homes that most of our residents and workforce can't afford. And we really see that that is a result of a lot of different rules that we have in our system. And first and foremost, it's how we calculate density in our zoning rules. Um, but many other uh, details as well. So there's no one silver bullet, but as one uh, gets under the hood and looks at a lot of the uh, details of our zoning rules and other requirements, we don't wanna just reduce barriers and then get a lot more big vacation homes. That's not gonna help the affordability here. Um, at the same time, we um, debate a lot about inclusionary housing, where we only build so much housing, and so the, there's no percentage of inclusionary housing we could set that's very satisfying, because we don't get enough affordable housing, and we don't wanna get no housing at all. Um, and the great structure that has uh, been working in San Diego to get out of that conundrum is to say, both of those issues, uh, to get out of both of those, is have a great bonus density law, where we say, okay, we're gonna reduce some of these barriers to creating more housing, but the access to those reduced barriers really comes from doing even more inclusionary housing. So we have the state bonus density law as a mechanism. It's very underused outside of 100% affordable housing projects, so you get to build more units if you build enough inclusionary housing. So what San Diego did is didn't just sweeten that trade off, it said if you go beyond that and build even more inclusionary housing in your project, then you can you know, get more density, presumably if you, can, if you build smaller units or if you build rental housing, you can get more density, um, you know, height where it makes sense, you know, et cetera. So I think as we are diving into the zoning on the Sustainable Santa Cruz plan, that's the ideal place to look at, as we're doing it, how do we create more rental housing, how do we create more smaller, less expensive housing, and how do we get more inclusionary housing? How do we uh, develop these rules so that the market forces as well as affordable housing developers can accomplish that. And I think the great news is it's really happening out there, it can be done. We've got some of the details there, although that's meant to apply around the Monterey Bay region. So uh, when you look at one ju specific jurisdiction and what our rules are, you have to get even more Thank you. detailed in that. Thanks. Thank you, thank you for the report too. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, supervisors. So my name is Rocco Capella and um, I'm a, I live in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, my daughter goes to Mission Hill Middle School, I'm quite active with the uh, Parent Teacher Association, and I'm also active with the Santa Cruz Education Foundation. So um, the reason why I'm here this morning is I wanna um, just make a few comments about mental health. I know there's a big discussion going on in the community about that, and I wanna encourage um, the supervisors to also not forget about um, the public school system. So I know that when Prop 63 passed, there was a big emphasis on children 
Um, we would like to hope that most of our children, at least to 18, are in school. Um, so that's kind of where you can reach them. Um, you know, I'm not a professional mental health person, so I don't know like exactly how you would do that. But I do know that they do need some help at the, in, uh, at least in the public school system. I think um, PVPSA in in uh, Watsonville does a great job. Um, I'm not sure kind of how that filters down to the other um, school districts, um, but I would like to just encourage you to um, to consider all of that as this you know discussions going on. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Matt Huerta, uh, Housing Program Manager with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. Also wanted to uh, talk a minute about the um, policy paper that we recently uh, <laughs> released. Um, many of you are familiar with the Monterey Bay region's tremendous need for affordable housing across the, the three counties that we represent. Um, over two years ago now, um, MBEP established at least trying to figure out what are the major strategies that we can employ to try to achieve uh, the goal of 10,000 units uh, homes over um, several years time, the planning period through 2023 is an example. So a huge goal, but you have to do something um, along many fronts in order to even attempt to get close to that. So um, this policy paper represents uh, another attempt uh, to work uh, with lo our local government partners to get there. I just wanted to mention three quick items. So one of, so there's nine policy recommendations, one of them which uh, talks about fee structures. Um, we want to recommend that, the, that we scale all the fees, impact fees, by square foot, not per unit. Um, simply that if a developer will pay the same impact fee, whether they build a 1,200 square foot home or a 25 hundred square foot home, they are incentivized obviously to build larger and sell the home at a higher price. So we need to fix that. Secondly, that we want to be able to offer um, developers a deferred impact fee schedule um, that they essentially pay the, these larger fees at uh, the time when those impacts are felt basically at certificate of occupancy. Many other jurisdictions have followed this and it, it greatly improves but the potential for affordability um, for those projects. Uh, thirdly, we want to utilize the vehicle miles traveled framework for analyzing traffic impacts of housing development. This framework recognizes that infill development is better overall for a community's traffic, even if it is near a heavily used street or intersection than is building that better than that than building housing from far from jobs and services. We look forward to working with you all on these recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Bert Marks, and I am a resident of Santa Cruz County. I'm here to talk about chemtrails. I'm here to talk about the spraying of our skies, streaks, crisscrosses, patterns. They are not contrails. Thank God, I looked up in this sky this morning, this beautiful Santa Cruz sky, and it's clear, it's blue, and I saw a jet plane. And there's a little trail following that jet plane. And those were condensation trails. When the airs get cold and you blow, you see this smoke, it's condensation, it's water vapor. What they spray up there is not water vapor. It goes from one end of this valley to another, one end of this coast to another. I don't know what they're spraying. I understand from government's sources, they've said that we're going to be geoengineering. We're gonna be spraying the upper atmosphere all over this earth. Uh, aluminum particulates, if nothing else, I forget, I don't know all the stuff they're spraying, but uh, what they wanna do is they wanna reflect the sunlight because we're, they believe we're under global warming and this is gonna save our planet. We're gonna reflect the sun and we're gonna cool down the earth. Well, that sounds good, I suppose, but I want this to be a scientific debate. I wanna see it before the scientific community and I also wanna know what they're spraying. I would like the supervisors individually and collectively to look into this matter because they're spraying all of us. I believe it's affecting our health. I don't believe they're necessarily trying to hurt our health, but in doing whatever they're doing for the global warming and the geoengineering, whatever they want to call it, I don't think whatever they're spraying there is good for us. And I, I don't even need to, I don't even know that they need to spray. Would you supervisors please look into whether we need this spraying above us? This is our county, this is our airspace. We have some rights as a county, as a people. Um, I don't believe that this spraying is good. I believe it's unhealthy. And frankly, even if it is good and it is healthy, 
I want to know what it is. I want to know exactly what those particulates and how much and where they're coming from. Is this military, top secret, experimental, government? We don't know. I, I, look, at, I look at the skies, most days they're filled with these chemtrails. And, and it, it, it's, it's disconcerting not to know what this stuff is, and it's not condensation. It's not normal jet condensation. So that's my point, and I hope that you guys will take upon yourselves to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, supervisors, uh, Zach Friend. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold. This community prides itself on being liberal and have a progressive influence in it. And the venues for entertainment and plays and speeches and ad hoc committees have always been available. Uh, for over a decade, there's been a group with open doors and a, a table for anybody's literature that attends. It's called Freedom Forum. Uh, it addresses many of the issues that you had come before your board here. It's been active, like I said, for over a, a decade, and we've held candidates' nights of which some of you attended. Uh, the mark of a police state is when free speech is attacked. The most dangerous is when the attacks come from government. The providers of space for Freedom Forum have been threatened with violence and destruction of property. Those threats were initiated by two of the supervisors sitting here today. I spoke before this board to do something to indicate those acts were not the responsibility of the board in whole. Of course, there has been no action. Uh, the county council's job is not to protect the crimes of the supervisors, but as officers of the court to report those crimes or be a participant of this attack on the, on the people and their Fourth Amendment right. The FBI has been notified, so I suggest you don't destroy your cell phones and your uh, computers. Um, again, uh, uh, two years earlier, uh, it's uh, the same speaker that attended, that the speech was broken up, had attended the resource center, uh, Mr. Coonerty's resource center over there, uh, the same speaker was there. So it was targeted specifically at uh, Freedom Forum, and it has a political spectrum across the board. I believe that uh, the power behind this is probably gonna likely lead to the uh, Panetta political machine. I think if anybody looks up Panetta Gate, they'll find articles on it going on for a decade at least. And again, the Santa Cruz Sentinel will never say a word about it. This Board of Supervisors maintained two plaques outside this chamber right here. If Robert Mueller we're looking for evidence of Russian communication or, or a, a collusion, they would find again this board uh, supports two plaques by a member of four Soviet Russian communist spy rings. You can walk outside today and find that there. You'll find letters, military information coming from Leon Panetta that go, went to this communist spy. Sorge, Perlo, Silvermaster, all communist spies and you are connected with the Panetta machine and represent the multinationals and not Thank the people you. here. Thank you. Does anybody else like to address us during oral communications? Good morning. Good morning. Um, Bruce Walker, in-home health care provider. Um, I'm here today to um, thank the board for signing and agreeing to our contract for the next three years. Um, it is much appreciated within the community. Um, we uh, work together on this, and um, you know we, we listen to you, and you listen to us. And I really believe that that really helped with the uh, negotiations within your negotiation committee. They um, they really seem to care and understand the uh, aspects of which we were. Uh, meeting. Um, in, in, in separate meetings with uh, the supervisors, I really saw caring and understanding 
about the type of work that we do do within the community. And with that, I really believe that um, we came up with a win-win situation both for the um, county and for the workers that do the type of work that we do. Um, once again, um, it is appreciated. You, you went and visited Sacramento. You sent letter to, letters to Sacramento. Um, that is another phase of education that we do need to do, and um, that is appreciated. So thank you very much for our contract. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Colleen Gard, and I'm here to discuss the um, Santa Cruz City wants some of the money for mental health from the county, and I'm saying please. Yeah. If I may just briefly interrupt, and I apologize for this, that item is actually on the regular agenda. It's uh, two items from now. This is an opportunity to speak on items that aren't on today's agenda at all. Okay, all right. So it's just a timing issue, but we do want to hear what you have to say when that So it's later up. on? Yeah, it's, uh, two, it's shortly, actually. Okay, all yeah. right, thank you, sorry. Not a problem. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, uh, Stony Brook. I'm your veteran liaison to the Human Services Commission. I wanted to take an opportunity to kind of update you on some of the things that are going on with your veteran community. Uh, most of you are very familiar because you visited our veterans uh, memorial building over on Front Street. You're aware of our Wednesday service program. For the general public, I'd just share that the goal of that is to improve access to health care, obtain housing and employment, and reduce the red tape and frustration a lot of our veterans feel when they're trying to get reintegrated back into the community. We use a uh, collaborative wraparound service to minimize the delays and incorporate a sense of community support for those vets. We've been utilizing our veteran service office that's run by the county. Uh, we have HUD-VASH, which is Veteran Assisted Housing, which is federal monies. Uh, EDD, the Employment Development Human Resource Center. Uh, we have a computer lab for the vets. We use CalVet. Primarily, we also rely heavily on the VA from Palo Alto who comes here and provides health services to our veterans so they don't have to be bused to Palo Alto or Monterey. We've had a lot of collaboration with Cabrillo College who's assisted us tremendously. So cutting right to the chase, I wanted to share a few numbers with you. In 2017, we registered 2,937 participants that came through the doors in 2017. We had uh, 425 that participated in VA medical services and the uh, American Legion of the United Veterans Council served 2,771 meals in last year. They also handed out 1,995 bags of food at the food pantry. Um, I'd like to offer a real quick shout out to our warehouse, the county warehouse, who has saved us thousands of dollars by providing surplus equipment to uh, refurbish the building. They've been outstanding, uh, they're wonderful folks. Uh, we, pr we provide this program every Wednesday from nine o'clock in the morning until 1.30, and I'd like to invite the general public as well as the supervisors to stop by and see what we're doing there at the building. Thank you very much. Thanks for your continued support. Thank you for your work. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. I'd just like to speak to some of the comment that's already been here. I'd like to support Victorious's uh, repeated request and mine as well, that the binder of full documentation for all of these items before you today be put at the back of the room, not down the hall. As Victoria said, you have to leave this room to go check on something and it would serve the public better to have that binder here. So I'd like to make that request again. Um, I'd also like to speak to what Mr. Sibley Simon said about inclusionary housing. I support that and I think the county should be doing a lot more to encourage that and to in fact require that it be done. Um, the Aptos Village Project got all of those <laughs> bonuses uh, for only offering 10, uh, reduced from 12 inclusionary affordable units within their project. And then I would also like to speak to what Mr. Arnold said. Um, I also have knowledge of what happened with two of your board members contacting uh, 
in shutting down the Freedom Foreign Speaker, and I'm really disappointed in that. I thought we were much more open-minded. The Freedom Forum group is a very welcoming group. Um, I've been to the candidate forums. It was the only candidate forum I was invited to, and uh, Supervisor Leopold, you were there too, and I really appreciate your participation in that. It's a good group, and they invite political discussion from all arenas. Um, I would like to uh, again say that the public parking out in front of the building is problematic. Um, it's getting better. Today there were only 10 county vehicles stored in the two hour visitor parking areas. I had to put my car in the uh, loading zone so that I could rush up here and not miss the consent agenda action that I wanted to take. Um, so there, there was no place and there were people circling and I would have missed my opportunity yet again to do some consent agenda work. So I ask that all county cars be removed from the two hour visitor parking areas, there are 10 this morning. And um, I would also like to uh, thank you, Supervisor Leopold, for chairing the Connect the Drops event that happened. That was excellent. Um, I left when I went to go move my car to a one-hour parking place that became available. I left the folders for Water for Santa Cruz, a group that I'm working with, and uh, they have some very interesting ideas for helping to solve the mid-county groundwater problems that do not involve the expensive and very questionable uh, pure, pure water SoCal project that SoCal Creek has. And um, I discussed that last night with the Water Advisory Commission with the city as well. I will bring those folders to your office, and I'm, I'm sorry I forgot to bring them, but when I park my car. Finally, I'd like to say the grand jury is accepting applications again, but this is a false thing. It's merely a cost Thank saving, you. and there is no priority for Thank those you. who submit an application requesting Thank to you, be Ms. honored. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Brenda Moss, Executive Director of Senior Network Services, and I brought each of you something this morning, hot off the press, is sure to be a bestseller, <laughs> the 2018 Senior Resource Directory. We got it delivered yesterday, so you're the first to get it. Wow. This is really, really, you know, it's so valuable. Every agency that's in here, uh, government, public, and community, is bursting at the <laughs> seams because the seniors in our community, as you well know, are growing in numbers. And this directory is what really helps a lot of people connect with the services here. So I brought each of you one of these. And also, this is uh, this a little, this should double in page because it's housing options for seniors, and it's the senior subsidized housing complexes and assisted living in our county. It's way too thin, but people need this directory uh, also. It's on our website as well. So I brought each you each of you one, and when you're meeting with your constituents, if you know they need services, let them know they can get this at Senior Network Services. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Brenda. Thanks for your ongoing work and leadership in this area. Good morning, Dr. Leff. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board. I'm uh, Arnold Leff. I'm your County Health Officer and Environmental Health Director. I just would like to report that I am declaring the Hepatitis A outbreak over. We've had um, <coughs> 77 cases, 43% were hospitalized. 20%, 20% were not in the homeless or IV drug using community. So there was approximately 20% spread outside the initial vulnerable community. Um, I think um, we have some things yet to do. Um, we do need to continue vaccinating uh, the vulnerable population and we are continuing to do that in our clinics and at the Homeless Persons Health Project. The other uh, equally important, maybe even more important issue is that we must maintain some sanitary infrastructure, both in the county and in the city of Santa Cruz. If we do not allow uh, for people to wash their hands and go to the bathroom, we're going to be faced with uh, similar outbreaks in the future. So that's the main thing I've been pushing over the last uh, a couple of months. Uh, I would also like to let everybody know there were 64 county employees from 
multiple departments that were involved in stopping this outbreak, and uh, they deserve a lot of thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your work and the work of all the public health professionals who helped us end this epidemic. Good morning. Good morning to my fellow Americans. I want to be able to show, uh, to remind members of the public what it is to be a good flag waving American, because we are good people, and I believe that. So I want to be able to, uh, to uh, put that up there. Uh, as I was scrutinizing the Brown Act, right, you know, it's frustrating because I don't want to reiterate this over and over and over. Um, we want to give uh, civil society activists uh, the proper uh, respect that they need in terms of weighing in on the political issue. Un under the Brown Act, right, uh, Section 54.950 says uh, public commissions, boards, councils, other uh, legislative bodies of local government agency exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. The conduct of the people's business is a light item agenda, which needs to be brought in this room, so we're able to scrutinize, peruse, and circumspect the whole thing. Uh, there's a, a functionary bureaucrat out in the hall, he got upset, he was like, he was like, Victorious, why do you want that in here, man? They got internet connection. My phone fell down, broke. I can't even get on it. And I can't even pay to make the payment so that it's online. We should be able to have a, a um, due diligence to be able to circumspect that uh, item agenda and speak up on, on the issue. And I want to be able to talk about community justice, because when it comes to community justice, it seems like it's not working in this county. You know, there's a, there's a, these political agencies are being used for nefarious means to work against the American public. And the judgment on justice in Santa Cruz County is, I'm striking out the DA's office. Let me grab this real quick. I want to be able to let members of the public know that, hey, as I speak out and criticize my government, they want to criminalize all political dissent, and it stems with the DA's office uh, maliciously engaging in, in, the, in these prosecutions that make no sense. They want to stack two of my disturbing the peace and resisting arrest in, in, in the court. And this is shameful because the DA, the DA office is just coming heavy handed. They're, these people are not, they have no common sense. They have no moral sense. And when they have neither, they have no sense. I would ask members of the public to really scrutinize, do we want this type of leadership in Santa Cruz County? I can't be dealing with this whole network of corruption. I need members of the public to take heed. There's all, all these other civil society activists that are talking about this DA. It's time to do the right thing and let's, let's impose a psychological reform on this political community because we want one county out of the 58 counties that's going to understand what community justice is all about. It's coming out of right. And that's what we expect because we're goodwill souls. We don't want, we, you know, if they, have, if they have every reason to punish me and impose sanctions, I'm willingly accept it. But in these cases, with me standing up and exercising my First Amendment right, I find it very shameful. And I would ask you guys as political bosses to push up on this guy and let him know that, hey, we need to end the corruption. Thank you. The political ills. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else for oral communications? Good morning. Good morning. As we talk about public health, mental health, justice, I feel like all of these things are negatively impacted by wireless microwave radiation surveillance uh, technology. And when it's touted as being for public safety, it's not safe when you're microwaving the planet and causing cellular stress and damage and increased cancer and death of the bees and all wildlife being damaged. That is not public safety or, or public health. And the fact that we are being exposed to this is easily detectable uh, by the facts, but also by detector of microwave radiation like this. I wish we could see all of this, like you see cigarette smoke emanating from your computers, everybody's cell phone, the antennas on the building might get a visual sense. I was in this room last Friday when the zoning administrator gave her rubber stamp approval to yet another cell site emitting radiation. The neighbors, every neighbor opposed it. 
and this is one of the signs, I'll pass it around, they have. It says T-Mobile Anthem Telecom. There's uh, no sign through it. This is on Calabasas Road, what was Pacific Crest Apiaries in Watsonville. It's off of White Road, if you know the area, and I used to teach at Calabasas School, so it's down the road from there. This is for a 78-foot steel tower, uh, not in compliance with the county code, in a residential agricultural area. A microwave dish is on the plans, three remote radio units, um, generator, three platforms for additional carriers uh, to come. This is like a major industrial, commercial, toxic site plunked down in a gorgeous rural uh, residential neighborhood. The neighbors opposed it, every neighbor who was here who spoke plus petitions they had gathered opposing it. And the only ones in favor were the T-Mobile representatives. This will impact property values and health and the quality of life there. And it's also the telecom gets to use this private road for their business. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us during oral communications? All right, seeing none, we'll begin the regular agenda. We'll start with item 52. Mr. Friend wanted to address. Is there anybody else who'd like to address us during oral communications as your last opportunity for oral communications? All right, seeing none. Uh, we'll begin our regular agenda, which is item 52, which is to consider the final appointment of Holly Shelton for appointment to the Community Health Center's co-applicant commission as an at-large patient representative for a term to expire December 16th of 2018. Before we get a motion, is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? Uh, seeing none for the board, and a motion? Move approval. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty, a second from Supervisor Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, it passes unanimously. Now we'll move on to item 53, which is to consider report and presentation on the Mental Health Services Act three-year program and expenditure plan for fiscal years 2017-18 and 19-20, to 20, and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Director of the Health Services. We have the MHSA three-year plan, the resolution, the budget table, the information notice on the prudent reserve, the information notice on the MHSA implementation and a letter of health services to the City of Santa Cruz dated January 30th, 2018. Director Nguyen, are you leading this? Yes. Good morning you. and welcome. Thank you very much, Chairman and members of the board. Jane Nguyen from the Health Services Agency. In front of your board this morning, our staff from the Health Services Agency, myself, Jane Nguyen, uh, Director of the, um, Administrative Services, Michael Beaton, and Director of Behavioral Health, Eric Riera. Uh, jointly, we will present about a 10 to 15 minute presentation to your board to go over um, the uh, three year plan for our Mental Health Service Act for our community, uh, covering fiscal year 2017-18 through 2019-20. Uh, this is to satisfy statutory requirements that we have to present this this item uh, in public for our board consideration approval to move forward so that we can draw down funding from the state. Uh, we also would like part of this presentation to include um, stakeholders input uh, during the outreach effort uh, that staff have done in the community and share with your board our recommendation. So um, somebody is going to click. Sorry about uh, that board. We're just gonna load this real quickly. There you go. Go ahead. So um, slide number two, just quick uh, reviews that your board know uh, what are we going to um, present this morning. We'll briefly talk about the background on proper Decision 63, which is the Mental Health Service Act law, so that the public is aware of what it's about. Um, we wanted to uh, share with your board some of the challenges impacting the greater, greater need for MHSA funding to support behavioral health services in our community. Uh, we want to briefly touch bases on requirements for a three-year plan. Uh, we'll talk about the current plan review, um, some comments from the public. Uh, we want to um, 
go over a little bit about the prudent reserve and then spend funds as there have been questions about those funds. Um, and um, the three-year plan recommendation to your board for consideration and some of the ch significant changes from the prior three-year plans. And then uh, we wrap it up with fu future changes and how we're going to further improve the stakeholder outreach uh, community um, outreach effort. So with that, I'll start with the background uh, real quickly. As your board know, uh, Proposition 63 was a really great thing that happened statewide. In uh, November 2004, Mental Health Services Act, which is, uh, we call it MHSA, was established to fund local mental health services based on a 1% tax on individuals making over um, income of $1 million per year. This is for individual income tax, not corporate income tax. Shortly after the passage, um, unfortunately, as you recall, California took um, a toll uh, with the recession that, that every county had to utilize these funds to support a system of care in the face of major reductions in funding. So the goal was to expand mental health services in California. However, because of the recession, uh, in order to maintain core services, uh, counties statewide were facing um, the choice of trying to use MHSA funds to continue supporting those core services instead of cutting them or, um, or, or limiting uh, them. So uh, when first established, it was projected that the MHSA funds would support approximately 10% of the entire mental health budget, you know, statewide and countywide. However, at this time, we looked at the, the state website and we learned that about 24% of each local mental health um, program were, uh, is are made up by MHSA, made up by MHSA funds. Here in our county, approximately 22% of the entire behavioral health budget is dependent upon MHSA funding. Um, briefly, as you know, by statute, the state requires county to divide the funding into major categories. And um, briefly, uh, one of them is the community supports and services. This is the major component, about 60% of all the funding to serve seriously mentally ill with wraparound intensive case management, whatever it takes services. Uh, we also have to organize it under prevention and early intervention. This is um, the component that provide um, preventative services to children, families, and uh, strategies to help um, individuals from having to uh, uh, enter the system uh, due to mental health issues and to have to be in long-term institutions so to prevent those from happening. And then also the state and local mental health directors recognize that we need to develop a workforce um, to modernize the work and to uh, practice evidence-based practice. So the WET, which is workforce education and training component became available as well. But recently the state has decided that um, you know we should not uh, focus on a lot of that now. However, um, local communities, um, behavioral health department could still use funding from other components like CCSS or PEI to, um, to, to help out with the workforce training and education. Of course, innovations, you got, uh, your board heard about innovations and uh, we can talk more about that later on during the presentation. And then capital facilities and technological needs, a uh, very important component to help counties uh, develop electronic health record system uh, to uh, support a lot of uh, laptops, computers for staff uh, to work in the community. And a big part of the CSS, community supports and services included permanent supportive housing. And as you board might recall, you supported the department uh, in conjunction with the Department of Planning here in our county, develop about 17 um, units of supportive permanent housing for mentally ill in our community. Uh, some of them like the Aptos Blue, um, the, um, the Lotus in Live Oak. We have two units um, in uh, Watsonville, Cornova, uh, Sova. And then we also have five units of senior housing in Capitola. So it was approximately about $3 million of MHSA funds that were dedicated to develop those 17 units of permanent supportive housing for seriously mentally ill in our community. So next I'll transition over to our behavioral director, Eric, to speak about the challenges. Well, as Jane mentioned, the role of Mental Health Service Act funds within our overall budget has become increasingly important particularly when we faced a number of fiscal challenges that we're dealing with today. 
During fiscal years 16 and 17, a major source of funding for behavioral health services, our 2011 realignment funding, <clears throat> was changed significantly to benefit some of the larger counties in California and negatively impacting the smaller counties. For us, that meant a $2 million reduction in funding, and that $2 million reduction continues into the future. The establishment of the No Place Like Home housing bond program in California is also going to result in a reduction of Mental Health Service Act funds totaling about $900,000 per year. The IHSS program through HSD has been restructured as well, and that's resulted in an annual loss of funding for behavioral health through our other realignment funding pool of $300,000 per year. State realignment funds, which are also a major component of our budget, are anticipated to decline further, with next year's funding projected to be $1 million less than this year's funding. We've seen an overall decline in county general fund contribution, um, and a couple of illustrations here. In 2008, our health services agency received $16 million annually in general funds to support services in the community. In 2012, that number was $8 million, and in the current fiscal year, we're at $9.6 million, and about a third of that goes specifically to behavioral health services. For fiscal year 18 and 19, the upcoming year, we've been negatively impacted with approximately $3.5 million in additional costs due to salaries, benefits, um, workers' compensation, insurance costs, in the face of these significant reductions in funding. As Jane noted, we're here as part of a three-year plan requirement with the state to review our submission and receive and seek board approval on this submission. And I just wanted to take a few minutes to go over what those requirements are. The California Welfare and Institutions Code does require a three-year Mental Health Service Act plan submission as well as annual updates to the state. There's a requirement for a public hearing at the end of a 30-day public comment period. And then the plan is submitted to the County Board of Supervisors with a request for approval and then we submit to the state. Our current plan was due back in December, but due to an extended public comment period, we requested an extension through February. In terms of the current plan review, we held a community forum back in September in Aptos during an evening meeting. We had approximately 50 to 60 participants during that meeting. We had made meeting announcements through local papers and through our email distribution lists as well as through our stakeholder and provider community. We had a public comment period between September 18th and October 18th and we had a request for additional public comment period and we extended that to November 12th. We held a public hearing in Watsonville on October 19th and the behavioral health director myself also had a separate meeting with the city of Santa Cruz with the current mayor, the city manager, the police chief and the fire chief to review their comments separately. In terms of summarizing the comments that we received, um, the first set of comments that came in um, were around Laura's Law, an issue that we had reviewed with the board last June. We received 148 letters via email uh, encouraging us to adopt Laura's Law using Mental Health Service Act funds. We also received a number of comments supporting the current array of services funded by MHSA. Um, there was also comments um, around consideration of focus on new needs in the community, such as expanded work with law enforcement and a renewed focus around homeless issues for individuals with mental illness. Continued need to address high risk and high need populations, such as eating disorders and forensic cases, which we've seen a significant rise in over the last two years. And these are particularly costly for the county because the services required are often not reimbursed by Medi-Cal. So we tap into Mental Health Service Act funds to support those individuals. And then we had a request for a meeting, as I mentioned, with the city to provide feedback and request information on MHSA priorities. 
We did meet with city leadership. We had a follow-up meeting on February 12th, and we reviewed information um, both in writing <coughs> and in person on our MHSA spending, and we've included this in the board packet today. At this time, I want to take the opportunity to thank um, our bo your board for your guidance and support in working closely with the city on this topic. I also would like to um, express our appreciation to the city of Santa Cruz mayors and the city councils and their staff um, for their um, interest in this three-year plan and um, helpful input and advice on quality improvement for the next three years. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Beaton to talk about our prudent reserve and unspent funds. Thank you. Throughout this process, there's been uh, quite a few questions regarding the uh, prudent reserve and the unspent funds uh, currently maintained uh, for as an operational reserve within the Health Services Agency. Currently, the prudent reserve uh, is under state law, and we are required to have one uh, per state law. At one time, that prudent reserve requirement was a 50% reserve. When you, uh, of the individual MHSA funding portion. When you take that 50% of the individual funding po portion of MHSA, it's about seven to eight million dollars annually. Currently within the Health Services Agency and the County of Santa Cruz, we have approximately 3.4 million dollars. So about half of what the state guidance used to be for a prudent reserve uh, based on our funding size. That $3.4 million equates to about three months of actual funding, uh, operational funding for the department. In order to, for us to access that funding, it requires state approval uh, with an economic downturn. It also requires the Board of Supervisors approval for us to even access those fundings. And again, the Health Services Agency combined with the prudent reserve and the unspent funds, we use these as an effective operating reserve. When we talk about the unspent funds, uh, to better classify what unspent funds are and to kind of have a better understanding of what unspent funds are, we currently get monthly deposits from the state of MHSA funding. At the end of the year, uh, so when we get a monthly deposit from the state, we basically spend that money within three months. That three month gap of funding that we get is considered unspent. That unspent balance by what we're projecting for 1920 is about $2.9 million. So when you think about unspent money, it's really the money that we're getting right now on a monthly deposit that we actually end up spending three months later. That three month gap is in essence our unspent funds. So when you think about it that way, it's a little bit different perspective. Now statewide, we have three to 10 years to actually spend that money before it actually reverts to the state. And locally, we are actually spending that money within three to four months. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a perspective. The project, again, the projected balance of these funds is about $2.9 million at the end of this MHSA three year plan. Now, when I say estimated dollar amount, nothing's set in stone. Every time the state comes and does an audit of our cost reports, every time the state does a review, they make changes to our cost reports. And when those changes happen, it changes the dollar amount that we have available for unspent funds. Every single time they have a finding uh, in a cost report or we owe some money back in a cost report, those funds end up coming from a mix of local funding match with realignment and MHSA funding. Now, locally within the Health Services Agency, we've adopted one of the state, uh, one of the Board of Supervisors policies, which is a 10% reserve uh, of our funding streams within our behavioral health system. Now, when you combine the prudent reserve of $3.4 million and the unspent balance of $2.9 million is what we're projecting at the end of uh, 1920, that actually equates to about 8% reserve. So we're actually under what the Health Services Agency has adopted as the board's policy of a 10% reserve within the operations. Uh, that's kind of a quick background of the unspent funds and the prudent reserve. Sorry, with this, uh, I'll transition it back over to Director Nguyen for. Thank you, um, Mr. Beaton. Actually, it's going to be um, Eric that's going to be presenting next. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. In terms of the recommended three-year plan, um, the current plan covers fiscal years 17, 18 through 19, 20. And the recommended plan has a total three-year expenditure of $43 million, which is leveraging approximately 40% of that amount through federal funds and other funding sources for services to be provided in the community. 
In terms of some significant changes from our last plan, the first centers around our innovations program, which is our integrated health and housing supports program. This program was approved by the Board of Supervisors last January 2017 and by the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission in May 2017. The development of that innovations plan involved community input as well as a public hearing um, in Sacramento at the Mental Health Services and Oversight Commission. And this innovations plan, which was ultimately approved, served as the foundation and matching funds for the county's whole person care grant application, which became operational on July 1st, 2017. The focus of both of these programs are to improve outcomes with individuals with mental illness, substance use disorders, and a co-occurring health condition through the use of enhanced services, better coordination and collaboration, and telehealth home monitoring. The second significant area of change in our plan submission is around prevention and early intervention programs. As Jane mentioned, that's one of the categories that's funded through MHSA. In July 2016, the state published new regulations and requirements for local county PEI programs. And from that, we were able to expand our mobile emergency response services and crisis intervention services due to the renewed focus on those, on those areas through the PEI regulations. Our county MERT team provides crisis evaluations in the office and in the community, and crisis response services include the law enforcement liaison program with the city of Santa Cruz, the Watsonville Police Department, and the sheriff. And finally, the third significant change in our plan is supporting the expansion of drug Medi-Cal services. With the expansion of drug Medi-Cal in Santa Cruz County, MHSA funds have been directed to support the additional infrastructure needs and support the expansion of services in the community, as well as meet additional state managed care requirements that we're obligated to follow. The expansion of drug Medi-Cal services, as your board knows, will allow the county to significantly expand capacity for residential and outpatient substance use disorder treatment from 1,500 individuals per year to over 3,000 individuals per year. Now based on feedback that we received this year with our plan development, we are planning some future changes to the MHSA planning process. Our MHSA planning coordinator retired last December, Alicia Nehetta, and with new and increased interest from the community in being more involved in the planning process, we're currently recruiting for an MHSA coordinator to implement a number of changes based on the feedback that we received and as part of our commitment to a continuous improvement process. We'll continue working with the community and key stakeholders, including clients and families, our service providers, and local cities and municipalities to identify key issues and return to the board with recommendations for our next annual plan update. I'll wrap it up with the last slide. Um, the Health Services Agency would like to um, let your board know that we are looking forward to continuing improving our planning and engagement process and updating your board um, on our progress. So our recommendation today for your board to consider is to adopt a, adopt a, res a resolution approving the submission of our MHSA three-year program and expenditure plan for fiscal year 2017-18 through 2019-20 to the California Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission and the State Department of Healthcare Services and out authorizing the director of the agency to sign all documents required for the submission. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any brief questions from board members before we open it up to the community? Supervisor Coonerty. Sure, just one quick question um, then we can get into some of the details. But uh, <coughs> I know you met with the city last week. H have you gotten a response uh, from the mayor or uh, other city officials about this plan and the, and the future outreach plans and funding going forward? Yes, yeah, we met with the mayor and uh, city manager and his staff on Friday last week, the second. 
It was a very productive meeting. Um, the mayors uh, had uh, a few questions um, as well up from the response letter that we issue from the department. And um, it's uh, appeared to me that the mayors understood the plan and um, wanted to be, um, the, the uh, wanted the county health services agency to, um, in, in, to, in moving forward to uh, further engage the city from um, the beginning uh, and uh, having meetings hold, held in the city areas as possible. Um, and also ask them, the health services agency to continue looking at MHSA funding's opportunity to um, support uh, mental health leaders on position if possible in, in the future. And you're willing to do those things? At this point, due to the fiscal constraints that we just described to your board, uh, we really need to work with stakeholders, um, including the CDs, all CDs in the county as well, to look at sustainability and um, any options that we may have um, to further review that request. Okay. Are there other brief questions? Uh, Supervisor Caput, did you have one before? I want to thank you for all the interest and all the time you're putting in on this uh, because it is very important. Um, uh, just quickly, we're, we're talking about um, some of the funding or whatever uh, would would go to Santa, the city of Santa Cruz. Is that what they're requesting? Um, they're requesting consideration to fund um, another mental health uh, uh, liaison position to work with law enforcement with the Santa Cruz Police Department to ride along. Uh, to have two ships coverage. Right now, we're already having two positions uh, to support the city in that effort. Yes, that's what they were requesting. Right. But, uh, but they don't want to fund it on their own. They want us to fund it. Yeah, they would like for our county to consider using MHSA funds to fund that yeah. additional position. And what, they, they don't have the money on their own then, I guess. I, uh, that's what I'm getting at. I'm, I'm, why, are they not, why are they trying to create a position and then have us uh, uh, fund the whole thing. <laughs> um, I would imagine that might be the case, yes. <laughs> That's a tough one to answer. Yes. Okay, and, uh, and, and Watsonville is not requesting anything. We work with uh, Watsonville uh, law enforcement and the uh, city management staff very closely in the last few years. We actually have a position stationed in Watsonville to uh, be a liaison with their law enforcement there as well. And it's a sharing, it's a sharing partnership. A, a shared yes. partnership, yes. right. With that, the sheriff as well, it's a sharing partnership. So that's basically what we're looking at now is continue to have shared partnerships. Yes. And also restrictions on how we spend the money that we get, right? Yes, there are a lot of restrictions in how to leverage funding, how to claim funding, how to bill, and how to document those funding, yes. Yeah, and uh, I know I, we talked before, and uh, again, I, the, all the time and interest you're putting in this is wonderful, because uh, uh, it's really needed right now. Uh, if, if we were to just say, it's more hypothetical, if we were gonna say, oh, we're gonna pay for this, the whole thing, uh, what accountability would we have to the state or uh, federal money? I mean, would they say, hey, you're, you're not spending it wisely? Um, we would like to be data and outcome driven. So before we uh, present to your board any recommendation for funding uh, certain services or personnel, we wanna make sure we look at data to make sure there's a need there. And we also want to make sure all stakeholders in the community uh, would um, have consensus on those uh, needs. Sure. And so, and then we present to the state and the state certainly would take a look at that as well and review it and consider it. And, and I guess uh, homeless issues are always tied in, tied in with this. This is a big uh, expense right now. So um, would some of the money, uh, this is sort of uh, earmarked, I, I understand that. Is some of the money though uh, being now allocated to, um, we have the homeless people behind us here on the San Lorenzo you know, Creek. But the, there's a plan in the future to have a, an area in another part of the uh, city and county, it's actually county property, uh, if they were moved over there. Uh, is some of that money allocated for that? I, I don't know how that works. 
Um, we would like to continue working with all the partners um, under the leadership of our CAO and your board guidance um, to look at um, how to provide services in those areas. Of course, when there are mentally ill folks, individuals who need services, we'll be there to serve them. Yeah, and uh, lastly, I, th I guess would be uh, um, all of a sudden we have the encampment here uh, behind the building. Uh, they, they were basically moved here by the city of Santa Cruz. I mean, they were told that they couldn't be where they were, and so they had to come over here. I'm not saying maybe, uh, yeah, anyway, yeah. How do, how do we answer that? Is that what happened? The city of Santa Cruz moved them over here? I don't know that that's really germane to MHSA through your funding, so I'd, I mean, it's an, we've, we've had a home, I mean, it's a valid question, but it's not really relevant to this item on the agenda, per se. I don't know that Director Gwynn would be the, the most qualified to answer that question, so. Thank you. I'm trying to see how this funding is going to go. The, the funding's not connected to yeah. that element. Uh, if I may, we do have our staff from HSA providing uh, essential and mandated services in the air bench lands where the, the homeless individuals are. We do have staff that go all there to provide services okay. for public health and behavioral health services. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, uh, from a, a budgeting financial perspective, uh, I would classify this as nothing less than a volatile moving target um, with swings of two to three million dollars each year. That is correct. And with some of the, um, w what the state and feds are requiring and so forth, how confident can we be when we're developing this three-year plan that there's some, some stability and there's not gonna be these swings? Um, I, I wanna compliment you for working as well as you uh, have under the, the current, or the recent conditions of these swings, like I say, of a couple million, three million dollars a year. But how stable do you think the state and federal programs are to support the system that we want to uh, to provide our the citizens of Santa Cruz County? Uh, I think, as you mentioned, we are dealing with a very volatile market right now. And one of the trends that we saw emerging last year was that the California legislature was actually um, <coughs> earmarking specific MHSA funds for statewide initiatives. And we've received some indication that, they'll con that that trend will continue in the future. So we may see further losses in MHSA funding for specific statewide initiatives that are adopted by the legislature that will have a negative impact on the county. Um, that on top of you know the unpredictable nature of these tax receipts, um, there tends to be significant lags and it's very hard to predict. So we try to keep our spending in line with what we estimate the annual appropriation to be on those funds and streams. Well, I guess a, a really a substantial good luck with that uh, is what you can, how you can respond. Uh, if there's anything that we can do to get ahead of that, and I'm sure you will keep us up updated on that, uh, because I know that the uh, CSAC, the California State Association of Counties is working um, on this as well, but really they, uh, the state can only uh, negotiate with the federal government, I think, in this aspect. So we're one step removed from really the, what, what is gonna be the decision in the end, but uh, anything we can do in the end, because uh, there's not a person in this room or in this county that doesn't want us to provide as many services as we can, but the, the necessity for a reserve is real and we must keep it, especially in light of these uh, financial swings and uh, grants or whatever um, that we have. So I wanna thank you for <coughs> trying to keep up with it as best you can, but uh, this is something that's gonna be, we're gonna have to keep our eye on and I know you know that very well, so thank, thank you. Thank you. But now I'd like to open it up to the community. This is an opportunity for you to address us on uh, this item. I know there were a couple people that tried to speak during oral communications. Now would be the opportunity for you to come up and speak on this item. Thank you for your patience. Good morning, welcome. Uh, Bob Campbell here, uh, Foster Grant, um, the, what am I, the, uh, the uh, program director for the Senior Companion Program from the uh, Seniors Council. And our Senior Companion Program um, provides peer companion services for the Mental Health Services Agency as part of the uh, MSHA three-year plan. We've been doing that for a number of years now. We provide over 
3,000 hours of uh, peer support services as part of the prevention and early intervention um, senior uh, services to older adults. I have uh, two of our folks with us today, Martha, who is our volunteer, and Herbert, who is one of our clients, who'd like to talk to you about what it's like being part of the program. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the senior companions working with Santa Cruz County Mental Health. This is a vital program. We provide transportation, encouragement, respite, and companionship to older adults with mental issues. Providing these services sometimes makes the difference between an individual being able to live at home or being put in a nursing home, which can be very cost prohibitive and demoralizing. Our program also aims to alleviate the loneliness that these people endure and to enrich their lives any way that we can. I take them on outings. They've been to the aquarium. They've been to Big Sur, Pigeon Point Lighthouse. I'll do anything that's legal that will give them some joy in their lives. This Sunday, if you come to Fast Eddie's, I'll be shooting pool with one of the clients because that's the only thing that gives him pleasure. And this is important. We should all have something for which we can look forward. We take them shopping for food, clothing, other necessities. Uh, we sign them up for Gray Bears deliveries, for Meals on Wheels. And at the end of the month, when everybody seems to run out of food, I take them to food pantries, and I take them to places where meals are served to people in need. Now, I could talk about this program forever, but you don't want to hear that. What I want to do is introduce a man who turned 90 years old on Sunday. He was my first client. He lived in a dump where he was allowed to take one shower a week with no grab bars, and every night his dinner was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I witnessed this myself. We got him into La Posada, and he'd like to tell you how his life took a complete turnabout. Thank you. Uh, I like the exercise there and at La Posada, and the meals uh, are great meals that we get there now, compared with what I went through before, and uh, private bath and kitchenette and friendships. Friendships are very important. Uh, and uh, a swimming pool, they have a swimming pool there. And picnics and parties and entertainment. And no curfew. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Notice he doesn't <laughs> use a walker or a cane. He's Thank 90 you. years old. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Leonard, welcome. Okay. Um, my name is Sarah Leonard, I'm the Executive Director of MH Can of Santa Cruz, which stands for Mental Health Client Action Network. Um, MH Can is funded by Mental Health Services Act funding. Um, we support the county three-year plan, um, and we support and stand in solidarity with other mental health programs which are funded by the Mental Health Services Act funding. Um, locally, oftentimes, um, homelessness is conflated with mental health, and the MHSA funding is slated toward severe mental health diagnoses and mental health, and, and um, although there is crossover, the two populations are not the same. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Hello, my name is Rachel. I also work at MH Can. Um, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm also someone who has multiple mental health diagnoses. I'm a registered and active voter. Um, I see every day I'm at work how these funds support the people who live in the city and in the county. Group therapies and community support, those are just two of the 
things that we offer at MH Can that is, like Sarah said, funded through MHSA money. Um, the money makes big differences for people through funding these services. Um, for future plans with MHSA money, I, as a person with diagnoses, I would encourage the county to have even more accessible collaboration with people receiving mental health services directly, more specifically people with severe mental health diagnoses. That being said, thank you for funding and I do, um, I am overall happy with the three-year plan um, and I believe that the county should remain in control of MHSA funding. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Martinez, welcome. Good morning, Chair and members of the board. My name is Monica Martinez and I'm the CEO of Encompass Community Services. I wanna thank the county for your partnership. Um, Encompass is a large contractor that uses um, a number of MHSA funds to provide comprehensive behavioral health support services. Um, so that's both mental health services and drug treatment services for both youth and adult through outpatient and residential services. Um, and I can vouch for how incredibly important these services are to a very vulnerable population that oftentimes is overlooked and, and forgotten in this community. But it's also a very complex time to provide this level of services. Um, as you heard in today's presentation, it's a time when resources are really shrinking, um, regulations are increasing, and um, it's a very volatile time to provide these services. Um, to go to Supervisor McPherson's point, um, it's, it's, it's a very challenging time to be a provider, um, and it's important for us to start thinking about what our priorities are as a community and how we want to invest these resources. Um, I really I really applaud the HSA, the department, um, who's really focused on evidence-based practices, looking at data-driven solutions to these complex challenges. Um, we need to be looking at, at solutions that are cost-effective, that are really the least restrictive, so we provide our, our clients with the, with the opportunities that they deserve to really thrive in a, in a low restrictive um, program. Um, opportunities that leverage funds that come from the federal or the state, um, and that also support support providers like Encompass and the other providers in this room to maintain our services during this really challenging time. So I support the plan and I wanna thank you guys for your partnership, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your work. Morning Ms. Delaney, welcome. Morning, um, I'm Karen Delaney with the Volunteer Center and we've been, we provide a whole host of programs for our community connection, family of programs and we too are strongly supportive of this plan and grateful for the partnership. Um, what I hope that we take away and continue moving forward too much of the time that we spend on complex problems like this tends to be an urgency of the things we aren't doing yet and not enough articulating the successes we're having and focusing on scaling what works. Um, when you don't have enough money, and we don't have enough money to have 100% universal service on demand, we just don't. Um, I am really grateful in this plan that they really listened to consumers, they really looked at evidence and data. Hundreds of people are working today who used to be homeless and who at the county, at the university, through our programs, we were able to leverage funds. Thousands of people have been able to access education at Cabrillo. I can think of two people who have gone on and got their masters in social work based on MHSA funding. Recovery is possible. This is a smart community. We know what works. It is easy to um, let people's opinions about the ways in which we're failing drive the train, but that's, we're, well, we're smarter than that. And I really do feel like um, the way that we can do a better job is really all working together harder to tell the stories of people who are born and raised here and happen to have a disability. And because of that, they really need support. Like any other person with a disability, we need to be doing more stigma busting. Like Sarah was saying, all homeless people are not mentally ill. All mentally ill people are not a threat. Um, we could tell a better story together, and I hope that not only do we pass this plan, but that we really all focus on, and we promise to do an even better job, of telling the ways in which people can regain their lives through the kind of smart services that we have in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. 
Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. I'd like to follow up on what Ms. Delaney just said and really highlight the successes. And I think we need to really give some accolades to the Homeless Garden Project that has really helped people kind of get grounded, literally, and to the wonderful um, MH Can and the, the senior volunteers here that we, we've heard this morning. Those are great, great things that are happening in our community. Um, I have a question for Mr. Rivas. Um, you said that, and, and I really am glad that, that you're working with the city and meeting with them, especially um, Police Chief Andy Mills. I, I really respect him a lot. Um, you said you met with them February 12th, but this is only the 6th, so I wondered if that's a future meeting or what that is about. And um, also, um, I, I have a question how the No Place Like Home and the IHSS uh, changes will, how those, how those affect the, the program here by reducing them. I don't understand how that could happen. Um, so I'd like some discussion about that. I really applaud uh, funding the ride-alongs uh, with the law enforcement, and I would like to request that it happen more with the Santa Cruz County Sheriff. Uh, let us not forget Luke Smith and how he may have benefited that night by having um, someone that recognized some of his mental health problems on top of what he was already experiencing with the drug. Uh, allegedly, and let us not forget Sean Arlt, who very much could have benefited by a ride along that night, helping to de-escalate the whole thing. Um, I also want to point out that uh, Supervisor Friend, your wife, Tina Scholl, is on the city manager's team, so um, I hope that that will be a good uh, coordination and cooperation and uh, very transparent. And in closing, um, I just would like to ask that there be more outreach in the schools. <laughs> My daughter's friend committed suicide over the weekend. It's, uh, it's traumatic for the whole community to have a young woman take her life. And I would really like some uh, further outreach in all of the schools for suicide prevention. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Oh, no, <laughs> I'm a rookie, so sorry. Um, good morning, like I say, I'm around, I'll be quick because I'm around a minute away from getting a ticket. So um, I'm here to, to support the three-year plan. Um, I've been a volunteer in the county for the last three years with mental health, homeless issues. Um, the last year I've spent a lot of time in Santa Cruz, the city, and um, they don't do a very good job. I would support to keep the money in the county, keep control of it, because even if they are doing a good job, who knows gonna be in the council next year, two years down the road. So I think it's really important that we keep this a county issue and support the groups you are supporting now because I think those groups are great. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. My name is Cole Courtlever. I'm one of the vice presidents of Front Street Inc., another local uh, behavioral health, health agency. Um, we primarily provide um, boarding care, supported housing, and outpatient services to the community. So I just wanted to support our other local um, community members like Encompass, MH Can Volunteer Center, and just um, reiterate how significant this funding is to us. Um, we're able to help so many individuals within our community who are in need, and we just like the opportunity to continue providing the services where we are now, um, integrate more um, innovative services that we're working on this year in conjunction with the county. Um, so just thank you for the, for the opportunity, and we'd like to keep it going. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, and also thank you for waiting on this item. Sure. <laughs> I'm Colleen Gard, and I um, been, have been volunteering with MH Can for over a year. I make breakfast on Mondays. And I'm not really sure how it all works, but keeping the money with the county would be amazing because what the city is doing, unfortunately, is listening to the other voices in their heads around the neighborhood. They've taken away the food bank for MH Cam, which was huge for them. It was amazing. It even helped us when we made our breakfasts. They've cut the hours. They're making, they're putting so many stipulations on MH Cam, it's almost gonna fail. We have to have a 24 hour um, 
security guard in front of the building and it's because of the voices in that neighborhood that has done this and the city is listening. I feel that you are a stronger force. You have all. You have a lot more power if you keep it together. So please keep MHCAN going and please be the ones responsible with the money. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Tina Hawkins. I am um, also here to support this. Excuse me. Um, I work for MHCAN. I'm outreach coordinator. And um, um, like everyone else that came up and spoke, um, I go out in the community and I see how this funding is helping people. And um, I just, I support this and I, I just, I see it on a daily basis going out in the, really going out in community, community, not just driving around. I go out and walk and find spots that I know um, I'll find people in need and try to support them the best I can. And if that funding wasn't there, I wouldn't be able to do that. So um, I just hope that continues. Thank you. Thank you, have a great day. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, my name is Angela Di Novella. I'm the director of programs for PUPSA, and we support our three-year plan as well. We receive funding to provide services at the school, um, mental health services, and early prevention intervention at the school system, at the school district in Pajaro Valley. So yeah, we, we would like to continue providing the services and it's critical as we heard before, the importance to be um, present at the schools and, and provide that, that intervention right on where, where the kids are. So, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, retired, uh, Marilyn Garrett, retired PVUSD teacher and uh, I'm submitting a document uh, on from Barry Trower <coughs> on uh, basically uh, there's a big factor here that's not considered much and I'm just going to quote a little bit from this document <coughs> of Barry Trower whose expertise is microwave radiation weaponry. There is a plethora of extensive, well-researched documents from around the world highlighting illnesses and impairments caused by microwave radiation. And this is just a small list. Sleep problems, mental problems involving depression, irritability, memory loss, concentration difficulties, headaches, fatigue, dizziness, suicidal tendencies are all part of this from the massive exposure people are receiving from cell phones, cell towers, laptops, you name it, that is this source of harm needs to be removed as well as we need to see that everybody has decent housing, food, shelter, employment, and that we don't have poverty. Unfortunately, this kind of, it's inherent in the capitalist system, permanent rate of unemployment, poverty, destruction of the environment. So this needs to be considered, remove radio frequency, microwave radiation sources, and when I hear about providing laptops, I just shudder, shudder, because that all increases the harm. It's documented. Look at the elephant in the room. Remove the radio frequency microwave harm of wireless technology. I think we'd see great improvements in how people feel and behave. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll close the public comment period and bring it back to the board. And just as a, just for a um, agenda knowledge, we do have a 1045 scheduled item. We will actually take that, that item next. So we'll take the probation item after that item. We'll take a five minute break after this. It's a brief break for people to get set up for the 1045 scheduled item. Well, uh, uh, we could move to approve this or this is just a report? Uh, we can, but w I was figuring that there were still some additional comments or, or uh, Supervisor Coonerty, you got your hand? Sure, just comments and then I'll make a motion. <coughs> get us going. So one is, I mean, I think there's addition, There's so much interest in this because we're seeing a crisis, right? We're seeing a crisis in our schools, our hospitals, in our public spaces, um, and there are not enough resources and people, people are desperately trying to find an approach. Um, I will 
parenthetically note that, as your report mentions, it's incredibly frustrating that the state comes forward and says it's bringing forward this affordable housing initiative, but all they're really doing is reallocating mental health dollars to affordable housing or these other programs. So, so they, it's it's as though we're adding new resources, but in fact we're cutting resources and moving, uh, uh, moving you know dollars into new boxes. Um, so first I wanna say one thing I really appreciate from this program, uh, from the three-year program and from uh, your work generally is that our mental health work and all of our work is getting more proactive, it's more outreach, it's more field-based, it's more comprehensive, so we're trying to help people through the system. And I think to the extent that we can continue to align all these programs uh, to do that, um, I think it's great. I really appreciate your work in reaching out to the city. I think it made a big difference in communicating uh, with them so they could understand some of our parameters and then also they could communicate their needs. You know, going forward, I think having this coordinator who does outreach uh, to all the cities uh, in, our, in our community uh, and then also if, we, if there is money available for emerging needs to be able to take proposals from the cities probably, you know, at least in the city of Santa Cruz for another mental health liaison with the law enforcement, but perhaps Watsonville or the county has, has ideas as well that, that could be jointly funded um, so, that, uh, so that we can get more, you know, try to tr send more resources to an area where we desperately need it. So with that and my sincere appreciation to you all and your efforts in developing this plan and the community for commenting on the plan, um, I will move the staff recommended action. Second. Okay, I'll second that. You bet. We have a motion and a second. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, mental health services are not well understood uh, by the public, and it's a constant effort to uh, to try to share information about all the activities that the county is engaged in, and the efforts by staff to seek out new money and uh, new collaborations uh, using uh, regulations at the state and federal level to, to do new pr programs. Um, this is only one slice of the, of the work. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot more going on. Um, one thing that we heard in testimony today, and I appreciate all the testimony we've heard, is that the county alone isn't gonna uh, be able to successfully address um, the mental health challenges that we have in our community, we need our partners, and as I look at MHCAN, the Volunteer Center, <coughs> the Front Street, uh, and the others, uh, Encompass, uh, <coughs> we need to have a good partnership uh, with them who are also on the front lines of being able to help us ad address the crisis that we have in our community. I appreciate that you had patience in uh, answering questions uh, from elected officials who don't uh, completely understand uh, what's going on. I know it can be frustrating to others who don't spend the time uh, to really find out uh, what's happening and I thought it was very unfortunate that they, that uh, one chose to use a tool that, that, that uh, was unnecessary uh, because they hadn't actually talked with board members or county administrative officer to find out the information. And so when people use crises to advance a political agenda, um, that's quite unfortunate. It doesn't help us move forward in addressing the crisis that we face. Um, I think it's uh, helpful to look at emerging needs and, uh, and this, uh, there are emerging needs all over the county, not just in the cities, but since half our, our population lives in the unincorporated areas, there are lots of needs. Um, and the uh, ensuring that there are mental health liaisons with county sheriff who are covering a lot more area than any of the cities um, is, what would be important to me as we look at, uh, at emerging needs. So I wanna thank you uh, for the work, uh, uh, Mr. Riera. I, I know that you've, uh, this falls on your shoulders quite a bit, but I also see Pam uh, Rogers Wyman, uh, who is outstanding also in this field. And I appreci the, appreciate the constant advocacy of my colleague, uh, Supervisor Caput, and his work on the mental health advisory team. He, he always reminds us about, uh, about mental health issues. Um, and the importance of ensuring that we have adequate funding. And I believe that by working together, uh, we, can make, uh, we can make a difference in addressing the, the, the crisis that we have in our community. So thank you very much. Thank you. We'll finish with Supervisor Caput. We have a motion and a second. Yeah, I uh, again want to thank you. Uh, it's uh, taking a lot of time and effort and uh, 
also all the work <coughs> you've been putting in with the uh, uh, mental health uh, oversight uh, advisory board. And uh, it's gonna take a partnership. Uh, we're willing to be partners with anybody and hopefully they're willing to be partners with us. That's <coughs> Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. We will take just a brief five minute break and come back for our 1045 scheduled item on core. Thank you. <laughs>
Good morning, everybody. We'd like to welcome you back for our, uh, what was the 1045 scheduled item, which is item 55, which is to consider a report on the collective of results and evidence base or core investments process, uh, evaluation and set aside process, approval of contract with optimal solutions in an amount not to exceed 61,000 for phase two consultant uh, consultation services, direct the uh, Human Services Department to return in March of 2018 with a recommendation for the set aside process and in October of 18 with a core progress report and take related actions as outlined by the memo. We have the memo, the core process evaluation, final report, the contract with optimal solutions in the ADM 29 <coughs> form and contract. And we'll turn it over to Ms. Timberlake. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Friend, members of the board. We're very excited to be here today to share the results of our core investment process evaluation and review next steps. As you know, reflection and continuous improvement are key values of communities that are engaged in collective impact. The staff report before you today includes an in-depth description of the evaluation process and methods used to solicit feedback and suggestions for improvement from multiple stakeholders. Over 30 key findings are clustered into thematic areas which staff will summarize in a brief presentation. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the many, many service providers, strategic plan representatives, funders, and review panelists who took time to respond to our surveys and participate in our focus groups. Uh, their feedback has been invaluable and we wanna thank them publicly. Additionally, I'd like to acknowledge Susie O'Hara and the City of Santa Cruz for their partnership. Lastly, I wanna recognize the hard work and dedication of our staff. The first person I'd like to acknowledge is Madeline Noya, our previous planning and evaluation director, who many of you may know has retired from the Human Services Department. Her leadership was instrumental in the development and implementation of core <coughs> investments, and we are deeply grateful for her contributions. Additionally, I'd like to thank Leslie Goodfriend, Tatiana Brennan, and our presenters this morning, representing our planning and evaluation unit, Shara Clinton, our contracts manager, and David Dabrowski, senior analyst and project lead for this evaluation. With that, I'll turn it over to Shara and David. Good morning, Chair Friends and members of the board. Check to see if your, if your microphone's on. You gotta, the, it should be green. There we go. Good morning. Um, as Ellen mentioned, David and I are delighted to provide your board with a brief presentation on key findings from our process evaluation of core investments. After your board approved all core contracts in September, staff launched this process evaluation to answer the question, how did we do? Before we share these findings, I will provide some brief, uh, provide some brief context by looking back at where we have been, and I will conclude with a summary of next steps. As you know, core investments demonstrates a significant local investment and a, and a change to focusing on results. Effective fiscal year 2017-18, your board together with the City of Santa Cruz are allocating close to $16 million over a three-year term that funds evidence-based programs and opportunities for innovation. So how did we get here? As this timetable reflects, your board has been thoughtful and measured in your approach to implementing this new funding model. Beginning in fiscal year 2014-15, you expressed a desire to evaluate and make decisions for community programs funding differently than in the past. At that time, you were interested in concepts like funding results and promoting evidence-based programs. To this end, you charged staff with studying local and nationwide models focused on collective impact. Based on the results of this research, staff identified these eight crit critical features that are consistently found in successful collective impact models. These features are the heart of our approach. With these critical features in mind, in fiscal year 15-16, we got to work. Together with other funders, strategic plan representatives, and service providers, we established the current model including the identification of prioritized results within nine community-wide strategic plans. Fiscal year 16-17 was a very exciting year, and we typically refer to this as, a fa as phase one of implementation. During this phase, your board increased your investment in this funding stream by 10%, established an annual set-aside fund, approved the issuance of a joint request for proposals with the City of Santa Cruz, and approved award recommendations for three-year contracts effective fiscal year 1718. 
At this point, I'd like to hand the present presentation over to David Dabrowski, who will provide an overview of phase one implementation and discuss key findings from our process evaluation. Thank you, Shara. The primary purpose of the process evaluation was to explore stakeholders' perspectives on the overall funding process, from the development of requests for proposals to the final signed contracts. A summary of this process is outlined on the screen. The following slides provide a high-level review of the process evaluation. A full list of the findings can be found in Appendix A of the report. As mentioned, our department sought to collect information on all aspects of the implementation process. In addition to exploring how stakeholders experienced all facets of the funding process, we also engaged their perspectives about technical assistance as well as collective impact principles. In total, 32 findings were identified across these three thematic areas. In conducting the evaluation, we collected information from a wide variety of stakeholders, including applicants, strategic plan representatives, funders, review panelists, and staff. Through a combination of surveys, focus groups, and interviews, staff were able to analyze both quantitative and qualitative data. The following slides provide a high-level review of some key findings in each of the three areas. First, let's look at the high-level findings on the funding process. Starting with the application itself, we heard feedback that the process was open to anyone. However, many applicants voiced concern that the application was time-intensive and difficult to complete. In particular, identifying evidence-based programs, EBPs, was difficult and additional support would have been helpful in presenting evidence. Looking at the middle part of the process, there are a number of findings regarding application review and funding recommendations. Let's start with some feedback on the funding allocations. You may recall when we issued the RFP, staff recommended to your board that we mirror as much as possible the historic investment levels awarded under community programs. This chart shows the amounts of funding that were available for applicants to respond to in the RFP. As you can see, our approach differed from the city in that funding amounts were rolled up into four broad areas. This created both flexibility and challenges. As a reminder, proposals came in requesting about $10 million. In talking to stakeholders, we heard suggestions that in the future, we should make allocations to specific strategic plans and or result areas. Associated with this, participants noted the review of the programs for young children and youth should be separated into distinct panels. There was general support for the composition of the review panels. Applicants suggested additional content to be weighed during the scoring process, which included past performance and previous funding levels, among others. There were compliments on the organization of the process from the review panelists. However, applicants wanted greater clarity in understanding the relationship between scoring and the final awards. Once final awards were made, the contracting process took the time that was expected. One area of concern expressed by funded agencies was staff attempts to standardize how outcomes are expressed. Based on a review of the proposals recommended for funding, staff worked during the contracting phase to design a categorical framework of outcomes that established consistency across similar results. In effect, staff worked with the contractors to rephrase outcomes. While well intended, implementing this approach during contracting caused some frustration and could have been addressed in the RFP development. Another observation from funded agencies is that with the elimination of the common application, contract requirements now vary with other cities and funders, and this results in more demands on nonprofits' time. Now let's turn to the other areas of funding, findings. The next slide shows examples of some of our high-level findings in the areas of technical assistance <coughs> and collective impact. Technical assistance was provided during the RFP in two main ways. First, through the generous support of the Community Foundation, technical assistance on selecting and implementing evidence-based programs and developing program outcomes was provided by local consulting organization, Optimal Solutions. The majority of attendees found this TA beneficial and individual sessions with the consultant were most helpful. Second, as you know, county and city staff communicated about the procedural aspects of the RFP and answered questions. Some applicants felt that the process of providing answers on a publicly available questions and answer document did not provide clear explanations in a constructive manner. In addition, other concerns about communication were raised. Multiple ap applicants noted not seeing emails that were sent. This highlights a challenge with using email as a primary form of communication. In the focus group, basic tenets of a collective impact model were explored. 
Overall, stakeholders desired greater dialogue and involvement in planning core investments. For example, applicants specifically wanted greater communication about the larger vision through regular conversations and engagement. Strategic plan representatives and funders expressed high levels of trust and good commu communication with staff. However, some applicants observed that more work needs to be done to strengthen the relationship and trust levels between applicants and staff. Both applicants and strategic plan holders believe that there should be a deliberate selection of strategic plans and that the strategic plans themselves would benefit from more coordination and communication across planning efforts. Intentional collaboration across strategic plans will enhance them and also allow key issues like poverty and geographic differences across our county to be incorporated and addressed in a more cohesive manner. At this point, I'll hand it back to Shara to review next steps. Thank you, David. Based on those rich findings, we move forward. The next phase includes engaging the community by developing a core investments vision and mission and furthering the dialogue about strategic planning. This phase aims to build capacity by monitoring and supporting core contractors, as well as providing broader technical <coughs> assistance. In addition, the preliminary community indicators that were proposed in the November 2017 staff report need to be reviewed and refined so that we may gauge how they can best be used. In order to guide these steps, we propose a new core investment steering committee be, be developed and facilitated by a consultant. Support for the consultant is made possible through a grant from the Monterey Peninsula Foundation. After a competitive bid process, staff in co consultation with a panel of representative stakeholders recommend approval of the attached contract with optimal solutions. The consultant has expertise in this area and has previous involvement with core investments. The consultant will initially meet with the individuals on the RFP panel, and together they will identify strategies to select representatives for the new core investment steering committee. We will, we will return to your board in October 2018 with a progress report on these engagements efforts. Lastly, you may recall that during budget hearings, your board made one-time only funding awards to service providers addressing emerging and unmet, unmet safety net, net needs not addressed through core. Next month, we will also return to your board with a proposed process for the annual set-aside fund distribution. This concludes the staff report, and we're happy to take questions at this time. Thank you for that presentation. Are there board members with brief questions before we open this up? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the ongoing work. This is a major change um, uh, in the way we look at supporting our community partners. So I really appreciate all the thoughtfulness that went into this and the care that went into uh, this evaluation. Um, there are a couple questions I have. It, uh, I like the idea of having a core investment steering committee, um, but I couldn't find uh, who would be on that committee. So well, uh, sure. I'm not sure. Um, as we noted, or as I noted, that um, the next step will be that the consultant will meet with the individuals um, on the RFP panel. That was a representative of all the stakeholder groups, and they'll identify strategies to, um, to basically engage individuals um, through our stakeholders to create the steering committee over the next uh, couple of months. Um, and so, so I guess I'm trying to figure out if the steering committee is going to uh, include groups that are funded or will not include groups that are funded. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe applicants um, would be included, but I'll turn this over to Ellen. I think that um, our view at this point is that the purpose of this steering committee is to continue the community engagement process around the broader vision and goals of collective impact outside of the specifics of the you know, funding process per se in terms of right now we're in three-year contracts. So we feel like in order to do what other communities who are engaged in collective impact successfully around the county, we need to be open to what we don't know, and we need to be inclusive of hearing the voices of both um, folks that are involved, their funders, a strategic plan, uh, representatives, as well as uh, nonprofits and service providers who are doing the work. So I think our vision is absolutely that that voice needs to be heard. Yeah, I and think needs it's, to be included. I think it's great to be inclusive right. uh, because we have a lot of experience to pull on. That's right. And uh, we're, all, we're all aiming at the same target, basically. Mm -hmm. And so if we, th the more we work together, I think it would be better. Um, it was, uh, as someone who uh, in, in a past life uh, uh, filled out applications for uh, county funding mm -hmm. and city funding, um, I, 
I know how difficult those former uh, applications used to be, and so reading about how intensive the this application was, I had a lot of uh, uh, empathy for. Um, and I also I appreciate that we that we tried hard to provide technical assistance, and and uh, um, I think that was great. And I think that, that we probably all learned a lot about how to best uh, support people who are choosing to um, apply. F trying to figure out about uh, 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 evidence-based practices, it seems to me that that's maybe something that could be an ongoing activity. Um, and when it comes time, it seems like, uh, it, was, it was interesting to me to read about uh, people who didn't have access to computers or databases to be able to check their own, th the work that they're doing, whether they fit that. And it seems to me that we should be able to provide either ourselves or through one of our funding partners a, a terminal with access to some of these research databases. Maybe that's even up at the university um, that uh, that people could could avail themselves of um, uh, the research that's out there to help better inform the applications that they're submitting to us. I think that would be a great idea. Um, the uh, The question about uh, strategic plans, mm -hmm. uh, and I like that they're going to be included, or uh, I think we call them strategic plan operators or something when we were doing this. Uh, the As we look out um, in two years, as we start this again, do we have any expectation or awareness that any of these strategic plans are going to be updated by then? Are we having any conversations with those, the, the, the organizations that uh, initiated those plans about the updates? A uh, uh, couple things. First, uh, one of the first agenda items for our consultant is to convene the representatives who were so helpful in helping uh, your board identify prioritized results within each of those plans. It's imperative that we connect with those plan representatives to get a feeling for their timetables on when those plans are to be updated. Some of them are already in progress. I've uh, had individual strategic plan folks contact me directly. I've had several right. meetings because they're anxious and I think uh, are very excited to try to find opportunities by, being, by working together on what aspects of their planning process. Will there be overlap and can we think about doing differently? To me, some of the issues that were identified by our stakeholders really have to be front and center on our agenda, including, for instance, how is poverty being handled? Sure. How is poverty being addressed across nine strategic plans? We took a, a leap of faith in moving the community programs funding model to this direction by, by recommending to your board that you not create your own strategic plan for $4 million, but that you look to the expertise and to the results and the community engagement present in those other plans, I think, so that, I, I think that that logic is one that we support, but there's a long way from a starting place to where we need to be, sure. to, be to be really coordinating as effectively with those strategic plans as we can be. And that's not even to mention the fact that all the plans that are represented in core investment, it's, it, it's a point in time and things change. Uh, the landscape has already changed. And so how we as a community dialogue about the future of using strategic plans as uh, an investment, investing in the results of those plans will require us to be open about a changing landscape. Um, well, I, I really appreciate that perspective, and I think by having this uh, steering committee, you might also look to where those, right. where those junction, th having those uh, plans work harder to think about where their shared goals might be, rather than individually ad identifying their goals. Uh, could help uh, make our collective impact funding uh, mm -hmm. go that much further. Um, the, the last thing I'll just say is uh, is a very hard uh, to define uh, issue of trust, right. you know, and whether people have trust. Uh, you know, there was, we, I know in the process of uh, creating the core investments uh, strategy is there were a lot of questions, um, there was, there was a lot of fear among many people, and what we what I see in this is that there are some people who still feel um, as though they th th they weren't getting the information necessary, and I I know from my conversation with you that you're committed to that, and I think that 
that's it, it, to me that this points out that it's going to be critically important to work on that uh, consistently over the next couple of years. So as we look at that in two years, um, that that we've done something to uh, to make people feel more included or trustful of the process. Um, it was uh, disappointing that the agencies that didn't apply for funding, who had previously received funding but didn't apply for funding, didn't respond to the survey request because I'm, um, um, I was very curious as to why they didn't participate. Uh, no one's contacted me from any of those organizations. And I think it would have been useful to, uh, to understand why they, they didn't, whether the application being too hard, was it that they didn't need the money? Um, we just don't know. Um, but I appreciate the effort that you've gone to to try to, uh, uh, to, to find out the information here and address some of the concerns. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else before we open it up for the community? Supervisor Caput. Yeah. I want to thank you also for, you know, all the effort and everything you put in. Um, there, there's, a, there's a lot of good that's come out of this. I, I think that uh, it could be better, but I, I do see uh, uh, good that came out of, uh, you know, this collaboration, you might call it. Uh, the only <coughs> concerns I, I have is what we had in the past with myself uh, is the, um, the application process and the paperwork mm -hmm. and uh, some of the smaller um, nonprofits that are out there doing their work, they don't have a staff that is actually good at the academic part of it. And uh, yet their work uh, is, uh, you know, outstanding. So I, I just don't want to see too much <coughs> emphasis put on uh, grading the uh, uh, semester paper. You're looking at it and boy, this is really well written. And then you look at the other one and it might be handwritten. What, you have to, what we have to look at is the substance of maybe that what was written by hand and the other one that is really, uh, you know, it's got graphics and it's got colorful pictures and all that. But one is actually maybe doing more work than the, the one that's able to present it better. <clears throat> and the other would be, uh, I, I'm getting back to uh, some nonprofits, they don't have a big staff, so they're actually doing programming, they're actually doing the activity. They're actually there all day, and if they don't show up, the doors almost have to close. <coughs> so small staffing and a few volunteers, and that's about all they've got. So uh, that, that's the only thing I want to be real careful with. And then also, uh, did we get rid of the minimum? Uh, is it still $15,000 or something as, uh, as far as the, the minimum? The minimum for the application for the RFP process was $15,000. And then of course we included, your board included a set aside fund for um, emerging and other safety net needs that weren't addressed in the plan. Yeah. And that's uh, that was a maximum, I believe, of 35,000. Which, which is f uh, fine, I appreciated that, but uh, what if I was sick on that day and I didn't show up, uh, you know, on the board meeting? That, what I'm getting at is the set aside is good, but it's almost like uh, somebody has to jump up and say, uh, hey, they need $6,000. I think that's the one it was for the Watsonville Senior Center. Um, I don't want to have to go through that every year. Well, one of the things uh, I think we're going to need to do is um, find new strategies for outreach and communication to make sure that when we do have opportunities for set aside funding that we do as much as we can and not just assume that people are going to be looking at the website. So we will actively commit to ensuring that a person who happened to be sick wouldn't miss that opportunity to submit an application. But I also want to say, based on your comments as well as Supervisor Leopold's, that one of the best gifts of this evaluation process is the very concrete feedback that we've gotten from applicants. So speaking specifically to the application, um, we will be able to take the feedback that we got and we know that we have to make that application process both stay true to some of the 
the core features that your board expressed an interest in including, but also get better at streamlining that. I mean, I, there were a couple of big aha and take home points for us, so I think we'll be able to make that application smoother and less complicated the second time around. And then back to your issue of trust, um, trust takes time. And I again appreciate and thank the stakeholders for being very candid about the areas that caused some stress, con uh, some um, trust concerns, and we'll double down, and you earn trust over time. You don't just get it because you want it, so we'll, we'll work on that. Yeah, and, uh, and again, uh, I, I like to see outcome, I like to see activity, I like to see what is actually being accomplished with the money, rather than too much emphasis on uh, application and how, how good it looks on paper. I, I guess an example of that would have been Mother Teresa. Uh, people said she was terrible at paperwork, but uh, she sure could reach out and help a lot of people. So, you know, that, that's what I want to see, service and actual activity. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, we now open it up to the community. It's an opportunity for you to address us on this core update. Please feel free to line up and share your thoughts. Good morning and welcome back. Thank you, um, I'm representing the Human Care Alliance. We sent you a letter on January 4th. Um, first of all, I wanna thank HSD. It has been really great to work in partnership with them on this. Um, our letter on the 4th was really talking about the next phase, moving ahead to the next phase, because we are all in on what we are trying to do here. And we, the three most important things that we want us to make sure we handle in the next phase are realizing um, how collective impact, successful collective impact programs actually work. And one of the things that was really interesting about some of the findings about uh, changing outcomes. We feel strongly that because we've got nine strategic plans and such a big portfolio, CORE really isn't one collective impact. It's too big for that. There isn't a single thing, goal or two, that we can measure across all those nine plans. So we really should sooner rather than later, job one is to get folks in the room and say, really, according to standards for collective impact, how many collective impact things are we moving towards? Because what collective impact measurement is about data. We have, as Supervisor Caput says, the programs already are really good at talking about their transactional outcomes. We're a year, we're a half a year into a program on collective impact without having any big data indicators that we're moving towards. We don't have a shared data set, we don't have a baseline, because across these nine strategic plans, um, the other thing that, so let's focus on, let's pick what are the five or six, is it four, is it six, is it nine, that we're moving towards. In terms of data, and the strategic plans, some of the strategic plans are data-based and some of the strategic plans are opinion-based. And we feel very strongly that while there is a room for opinion, collective impact is about objective data. And that going forward, strategic plans that want to be included need to step up their data game. And that this is something, none of us can afford this kind of data on our own, so we really need to work together to be strategic about how do we measure what we're moving together, both picking the indicators, also talking about realistically how that maps to the investment, because for some of the indicators, what we might, our, an appropriate goal might be in the next three years, we just want to hold the line on this. So we have a lot of work to do together. We are really excited to be, as the Human Care Alliance, to be part of the um, steering committee. We're grateful for this opportunity, but we have a big job ahead of us. It is just, the real work is just beginning. We're past the process and into really trying to figure out how do we measure the work that we're doing, and we are going to be a partner in that. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. 
Good morning again. Um, my name is Monica Martinez, CEO of Encompass Community Services. Thank you, Karen, for those comments. And I want to spend a moment to thank HSD for your efforts. Um, I've long been a supporter of this reform um, to really adopt the core um, initiative. And I just really applaud your efforts to be inclusive, um, to be responsive to feedback, um, to be data-driven, and committed to collective impact. Um, but I also want to remind the board that the issues that we are collectively trying to solve are incredibly complex. Issues related to housing, to behavioral health, substance use and mental health disorders as you heard earlier today. Um, investment in children and trying to create a generational impact on the quality of life on our county. Those are incredibly complicated and those results don't happen quickly. Um, so I'm here to ask that you continue to be courageous and be bold in these investments, that you look at where you can increase the pot to continue to invest in, in the, those of us who are providing these incredible and important services in our community, and that you continue to be disciplined and, and not be distracted by headlines or, or things that sort of bubble up that may cause us to want to go one direction or the other, but to really continue to invest in these just generational changes that I think that we're capable of seeing. So thank you for your efforts and your investment to date. Um, thank you to your department, and we look forward to being a partner in the future. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Hi, Sherry Storm with uh, Deantis Community Dental. I'm also here um, to echo support for this whole process. Um, we at Deantis really focus on quality metrics and um, the focus on uh, evidence-based practices is, is, was a, I won't, I won't, uh, be shy about saying, was a challenge to kind of come up with evidence-based practices that were valid for this process. But going through that and using the technical assistance has made all my proposals as a development um, professional better and to a wider variety of, of applicant, um, excuse me, grantors, so thank you. Um, I also wanted to say that um, when it comes to the strategic plan that you're going to be looking at and the participation in the steering committee, as part of Oral Health Access Steering Committee and that strategic plan, we look forward to being involved in that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for those comments. Good morning. Welcome. Hi, Clay Kemp, Executive Director of the Seniors Council, which runs the Area Agency on Aging of Santa Cruz and San Benito Counties. So um, we have a couple suggestions about how, how some of the flaws of this process could be improved. And you know, first of all, I want to admit or commit that everybody involved in this is trying to make our community better and pr improve local services. But there were some serious errors that could be corrected regarding the funding process for senior programs. And I think the first one is overall that the priority of who's funded should weigh more importantly the quality of service or the quality of the application more than the amount of funds that were applied for. And that can be seen in that the highest scored application in this entire process received a funding cut. And other critical senior services that had very high scores like Meals on Wheels took a $120,000 hit. So I think one of the ways things like that can be improved is if, look, if you look at the role our agency plays, we're probably the most familiar organization with community-based services for seniors. We've been funding them at $1.6 million per year for the entire time that I've been there, which is 20 years and probably 20 years before that. Unfortunately, even though we're a funder, we're not included in the funder group for discussion about how this rolls forward. So that would be one recommendation, to include all major local funders of community-based organizations in that discussion. We are a strategic plan owner, but unfortunately we're also an applicant for funds, and we're unique in that most AAAs are county-based, but we're one of the few that's nonprofit-based. So we can do a lot more things more flexibly than a county-based organization can, and we're also more cost effective at doing that. So I think everybody has agreed that that's a great model. But unfortunately, when we shift to core, that excludes us from being part of the review and feedback group, even though it's our strategic plan that's being funded. So we think an approach that you could take would be to take the AAA out of the core funding process, 
establish us as a set alone. We're a mandated program, so you know if we don't do it, you guys have to do it. And that would allow our expertise to be at the table when proposals are coming forth to do things like cut senior network services, which is the kind of starting point for all senior services at a time when the senior population has grown 43% over six years. It, it makes no sense to you know, take money away from the triage organization. And I really think those flaws could be corrected by merely shifting what our role or our relationship with the county is. We also don't compare well in terms of the outcomes and which strategic plan do we align with. You know, we write a strategic plan, so are we you know, going to somehow fit into our own plan? It's more a matter of whether we are the AAA or one exists or the county takes us over. So Thank we you. hope you consider that. I'll just add also, there's Thank some you. great recommendations in the focus groups that I hope are seriously considered too. Thank you very much. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Emmert. I'm the Director of Community Organizing with United Way. Um, I'm here to communicate United Way's support uh, with this uh, funding model, um, to show our support with the county, and also really recognize um, HSD's commitment for quality improvement. I also uh, wanted to share that United Way is currently um, in the process of shifting our funding and grant making uh, model. And we're in communication with HSD to ensure the integration of critical elements from the RFP from the county um, that are integrated into ours. So for example, the evidence-based practice tiered model, um, some of the outcomes and measurements are just some of the examples. Um, with our new funding model, we are also holding uh, the all-in strategic plan to end homelessness as well as the youth violence prevention task strategic plan, um, but we're going to be diving a little deeper to focus specifically on youth success, um, but we will ensure that there is overlap between the results that we put out in our RFP and what's under core investments as well. Um, additionally, we recognize the power in leveraging um, outcomes and resources, both financial and human, through collective impact. Uh, so I wanted to communicate our commitment with partnering with the county and others to continue the conversations around collective impact, um, and especially to increase community capacity around collective impact. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Hello. Good morning, my name is Angela de Novella from PVPSA, I'm the Director of Agency Programs, and yes, I'm here to support also this, this model. Um, we appreciate the fact that we together can, can build community and, and we support each other in, in collaborating and, and moving forward with evidence-based practice models. Um, I also want to say thank you for providing the technical assistance support for South County agencies. Um, that was very valuable even though um, we were there and, 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 and you guys were available to, to answer questions and help us with the application and the reporting process. So I appreciate that, that you came down to South County. Um, and, and yes, I, I want to say thank you overall and, and hoping that we can continue working together and, um, and overall emphasizing on, on the importance of outcomes and, and, and outputs, as you were mentioning before, that we together can build together. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the community who'd like to address this? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Sure. First, I want to thank you for the work, and it's really good to have this continuous improvement and this feedback loop so that on the micro level, we can build trust, get more efficient, get better data, get more information, and, and do it. I'm really glad that we're putting this effort, you put this effort in and, and are reaching out in this way and will improve. Uh, and then I just wanted to remind us that I think, you know, it's always good to keep in mind where we really want to end up uh, with this because you can get caught in the weeds mm -hmm. a little bit. And I think this pot of money, as was mentioned, will not solve um, virtually uh, any of the very complex problems that we have. But uh, when we look at the data and we know how many homeless vets there are and we know how many seniors are going out food and we know how many kids don't have dental care and we know what third grade reading levels are, we know all that in our community and, and when we should be holding an annual hearing as part of our budget with the Central Coast Alliance for Health, with the Community Foundation, with the United Way, with uh, all the different folks that are playing a role in this and saying, 
you know, is our crime rate going up and down? Is our recidivism rate? How's our third grade reading level? How's, uh, how many seniors have access to food? And really try to work on those numbers. And to Karen's point, maybe on some cases, just try to hold the line in the face of uh, bigger trends that are bigger than us or forces that are bigger than us and compare us to other comparable counties and say, are we doing, are we in the middle? Are we at the top? Are we at the bottom? Um, and so to not, to not just get stuck in this one funding stream and these one set of, uh, as it relates to strategic plans, but overall, when we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars being spent, how are we uh, making those investments and are we using all the different funding streams correctly to, to leverage real change? And so it's a long process uh, and it's a big goal, but I think um, they, I want to recognize that effort and keep in mind of sort of where we, where I hope we will end up going. Um, and with that, I'll move the, I think it's accept the, accept the staff report and the recommended actions. Second. A motion from Supervisor Coonerty, a second from Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I appreciate the ongoing effort because this was a change in the, our process of what we're doing. And that word trust, I think, is being developed as we go along because we're continuing to see how we can improve and make it fit better. I especially want to uh, think that we, we want to address our concerns about how does the this program that was uh, addressed by Mr. Kemp about how does the seniors uh, program fit and how, how do we measure that in better, uh, do, uh, do, how can we make it fit better into this process? Um, that's, that's a concern to me, I'm being a, uh, a member of that uh, area on aging, but uh, that's especially one that I'd like to see addressed and I know it will be, but uh, I do appreciate the ongoing effort and the, um, the, the continuous input from the agencies that were uh, that provide these services to those in need in Santa Cruz County. So, uh, yeah, thank you. And again, like I said, it's turning out uh, better than I thought, and uh, and, I, and I appreciate that. But I still am disappointed on the Second Harvest Food Bank not getting funding. That helps, especially South County, uh, where a lot of people are really struggling and also Meals on Wheels, which is really uh, countywide and affecting a, a lot of people. And actually, some of us in this room will be signing up for it when we get older. So and we gotta be mindful of that. And the other, the other, of course, is the small one, the Wattsville Senior Center, but thank you. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you for that report. I uh, appreciate probation and others waiting for item 54. We're gonna now move to item 54, which is to consider a report and presentation on the P.U. MacArthur Results First Initiative, uh, Juvenile Cost Benefit Model, and direct the probation department to return in March of 2018 for authorization to release an RFP for evidence-based juvenile programming as outlined in the memo of our chief probation officer. We also have the Santa Cruz Results First two-page summary final report. And I believe our uh, probation officer in a second here will be introducing uh, this item. Thank you again for waiting for your item to come back. Oh, good morning. Good morning, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and uh, Board of Supervisors. Um, this morning, it's still this morning, yes. I'm gonna continue on the theme of um, results and evidence-based practices. And I have a brief presentation about our work with the Results First Initiative and the development of our Juvenile Results First model, which I believe it's the first of its kind. Um, uh, with me today, all the way from Washington, D.C., right next to me is Ben Fulton, Senior Associate from the Pew MacArthur Results First Initiative, and I also have uh, Amelia Mejia uh, from CSAC. Uh, she's a program coordinator for uh, Results First, and I hope that uh, you might have questions for them, both uh, from a national perspective of Results First and of course, statewide in California. And I really want to uh, thank the Results First team uh, that I have here with their, for their technical assistance uh, since uh, 2013, since we started our uh, work as a county with them. I'm gonna make this a PowerPoint here. And I'll begin. Okay. Okay. 
I'll start for you. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Um, well, I just want to uh, say thank you, um, Chief Geraldo, for the introduction. And uh, as he mentioned, my name is Ben Fulton. I'm a senior associate with the Pew MacArthur Results First Initiative. Um, and before um, the chief gets into a, a breakdown of the results from their, um, their juvenile justice effort uh, related to our project, I thought I'd give a little bit of an overview of what Results First is um, and talk a little bit about the work that's happening um, in California and across the country. And so, um, as many folks in this um, room know, Results First is a joint initiative of the Pew Charitable Trust uh, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And what we are is a national initiative that partners with select states and counties across the country to help them engage in evidence-based policymaking. Um, and we do that in a capacity-building model um, that really focus on, focuses on um, partnering with those, um, uh, those real leaders in states and counties to help them develop their own capacity and expertise for engaging in evidence-based policymaking. Um, and so that is a, is a really kind of a big term there, evidence-based policymaking. And for us, it really means um, using the best um, research and evidence out there about what works um, to inform decision-making processes around um, policy and budget. Um, we do that in a number of different policy areas, uh, adult and juvenile justice, um, child welfare, mental health, substance abuse, um, and we're rolling out new kind of areas all the time um, in, in terms of health, I think, is the, is the newest area. Um, we've partnered with 38 jurisdictions now, um, uh, including Santa Cruz County, um, 28 states, as well as, um, uh, as 10 counties as well, um, eight of which are, are here in California, um, where really all of our county work began. Um, so every one of those jurisdictions um, kind of goes through a, a similar process in building um, the results first approach, um, but they all do it in their own kind of unique and um, prioritized way based on the, the community's um, needs and, um, and priorities. So um, that approach really focuses on um, one, building a program inventory of, of programs in a particular area and learning more information about how those programs operate in a particular jurisdiction. Uh, then taking those programs and comparing them um, to the Results First Clearinghouse database, which is really a, um, a central hub for a lot of information um, from research clearinghouses about program effectiveness. Um, and then taking those programs where there's really strong, rigorous evidence um, and running them through a Santa Cruz-specific benefit cost analysis model um, to try to get a sense for what is the potential return on investment for programs where we have a really strong evidence base for them. Um, and so what that does is compare the cost of providing a particular program against the benefits of the, that that program produces that's been shown in the research literature. So that would give you a sense for if we put $1 in this evidence-based program, um, what kind of return can we expect over the long term um, based on the best kind of research we have. Um, and so in Santa Cruz, we've been really focused on um, adult and recently juvenile justice. Um, and so we're gonna continue to kind of walk through kind of how this results first work plays out here in Santa Cruz, but I um, wanted to give you a little bit of a background on the, on the project as a whole. I want to talk about the juvenile uh, model goals, but I really like this uh, illustration because if you go all the way to the end, the end result is recidivism reduction, and that's public safety, and that's uh, uh, my department's role in the community, among others. And so if you step backwards, though, we want to show you um, what we want to do is uh, take a deliberate path where we are good stewards of the tax dollars. It's very important by making the best use of public resources and being deliberate in our intentions to provide the juveniles and families we serve with the best uh, services possible that will give them the likelihood of success in life and, and for youth, particularly transitioning into adulthood. And this is really why we use evidence-based practices. So from a, from a big picture perspective, the reason why um, the Santa Cruz Probation Department and all of our partners go through this really um, lengthy and technical intensive effort to build out a very specific Santa Cruz um, uh, benefit cost analysis model is because leaders um, um, like the chief here at the agency level as well as leaders in the CAO's office and, at, and board of supervisors level and when we're in the states and legislature and governor's office, all these folks are really interested in trying to use evidence to 
make strategic budget choices and have that information be at the table. Um, it's not a situation where um, you're gonna look at a chart and say, we just fund the, the top program on that chart or that the evidence is the only thing that you will consider. Um, but we think it's an important, um, uh, it can provide a kind of important contribution to that decision making process when you consider all the other factors into why you'd wanna fund a program. And so unfortunately, um, many leaders um, do not have access to that kind of evidence-based policymaking resources. And so that's why um, Results First partners with these jurisdictions and, and tries to help them um, uh, kind of gather useful information and, and present it in a way that will be useful. And so um, we started in a very uh, small number of states. We started in four counties in California, um, Santa Cruz being one of the first. Um, and we're now continuing to expand that approach because we've been finding that leaders across the country are really interested in this work and can benefit from it. So I'd actually like to turn it over to Amalia just for a second um, before we get a little deeper because in partnership with the um, California State Association of Counties, we've actually been able able to expand our footprint in California um, and work with new partners. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about that. Sure, so as you guys know, after realignment, um, there was a new level of responsibilities for counties. And from CSAS perspective, we wanted to make sure that county leaders had the tools necessary to address these changes. Um, so with the Healthcare Foundation new funding, we were able to expand to uh, two additional counties. So currently we are in uh, as the first original, um, like Ben mentioned, Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara, Kern, and Fresno. And since then, we since the partnership, we've expanded to Ventura, Santa Clara, Solano, and Nevada. And uh, we will be hopefully expanding to two more additional counties by the end of the year, depending on the engagement of interest. But counties are definitely um, being able to use this information as county leaders, and we're open to any uh, suggestions of how you guys might want to be, um, how this could be useful for uh, board, as Board of Supervisors. Thanks so much, Malia. And and I think that really comes down to the reason why um, we we think there's a lot of value in this work. And that is because the, the benefits um, of doing this kind of cost benefit analysis approach really focuses on um, decreasing recidivism, so improving outcomes in order to, um, to generate positive returns in terms of um, avoided victimization and, and um, kind of negative aspects that happens when, when crime happens in the community, as well as reducing the burden on public services, um, when someone um, recidivates, they go back through the criminal justice system and there's a cost at every stage of that system. And so um, th I think the really valuable piece here at the juvenile level um, is that you are, um, you're hitting kids at a, a very early level and so the ceiling, the potential benefits are, are even higher because um, you know, as opposed to um, intervening with someone at an adult level, um, they're further downstream and it may be more difficult to make improvements. But um, at the juvenile level, there really is an opportunity for, um, for, for investment to make a real difference in kids' lives and, um, and the county as a whole, so. So just briefly, I uh, wanna talk a little bit about our work uh, in Santa Cruz County. We kicked this initiative off uh, five years ago in 2013 and we started with our uh, adult uh, criminal justice programs, our services and interventions, and really we had a unique opportunity through realignment in 2011 where there was an infusion of new dollars coming through the state. So we really thought it was important that we uh, use those wisely, wisely uh, and results first really aligned with our county plan, our, our community corrections partnership plan was to use cost effective uh, treatment and supervision services that were evidence-based uh, for better results. So this clearly fit with what the county wanted to do. So we use the results first cost benefit model and program inventory first to help inform us in the design of an RFP uh, for interventions and services for the AB 109 population uh, that was released in 2015. Um, and as we began new contracting for adult services, we included new requirements that included prioritizing evidence-based practices, um, and we knew that th after we were doing that, the next step was to introduce results first and the, to the juvenile uh, model. Many of the providers, um, provider network and AB 109 also provide juvenile services, so they are uh, familiar with the steps that, that, that we're taking and the direction we're going, and, and, and clearly many of them are also um, part of the core funding model. Uh, these are the key findings um, in our, uh, as we develop our juvenile 
uh, model. Juvenile recidivism is expensive. The average cost of a conviction is over $100,000. This includes cost of victims, the cost of lost earnings, disruption in educational pathways, the cost of arrest, proce prosecution, incarceration, et cetera. So this is why it's important that we invest in interventions that have the highest likelihood of reducing recidivism. Earlier in intervention, evidence-based programs can re reduce these recidivism costs. For every dollar locally, um, according to our model, we know that the return is anywhere from uh, $2.31 to $32 that we, uh, that we can invest. Our juvenile alternative to detention program is, is seen there as a highly cost-effective program with excellent public safety outcomes. This is why we continue to invest in these type of beneficial programs. This slide shows an excerpt of what uh, we call a results first one page inventory that uh, it took mm -hmm. about a year to develop that, but it was well worth it. This is uh, hot off the press, and we plan to use it to guide decisions around the types of programs that we are currently using and or plan to use in the future. Um, we selected aggression replacement therapies as an example to highlight to show our, how our program inventory works in terms of cost-benefit analysis, uh, return on investment, and recidivism reduction. It took me a little while to figure this out, but I, I think I have it. Um, ART is an evidence-based cognitive behavioral intervention that my staff are trained in, um, and it's inexpensive. It's $600 per youth, but the cost avoidance is just over 8,000. Again, that cost avoidance is in realized cost of victims, community, arrests, again, et cetera. Um, we can see from this uh, that for every dollar we spend on ART, we get a $14 return on, on investment. So this, this example here we've already used, uh, it helped us determine that we needed to increase ART and expand the avail availability to, uh, to our youth because we were only uh, serving about roughly 15 participants, so we've, we've expanded that. Uh, this, this is again another uh, part of our results first inventory. Um, the local programs are in green are our local programs, <laughs> um, and we match these to the highest rated programs in the Washington State Institute for Public Policy Inventory, and that have the highest return on investment and f show a significant likelihood of reducing recidivism, in some cases by up to 10%. Um, included in these highest rated section are, is vocational training, um, ART, aggression replacement therapy, uh, restorative justice programs, and cognitive behavioral programming through uh, the Forte model. So in Santa Cruz, we have four, four of our local agencies already delivering these types of services. So the models already helped us inform uh, the scope uh, of work as we um, have go from year to year with new contracts. So I'm gonna wrap up our presentation really um, with recommendations. Uh, it's clearly evident uh, to us that programs and services uh, that are rated highest and effective to reduce recidivism is something that we should uh, use our juvenile justice dollars just like we do with our adult dollars. We'd like to maintain and expand existing programs like ART, um, want to recruit new services and programs that are out there or and work with our partners perhaps to redesign some of their current programs to meet uh, the emerging needs and trends. Uh, much of the, the way we are spending our dollars in juvenile justice has re remained relatively unchanged over the last 15 years. Um, um, and I, we really feel it's time to, to make a significant shift because there are um, just different emerging needs that we've discovered, new evidence-based practices, and, and our partners have, have uh, been there with us and have been um, uh, willing to adjust what they're doing. So we um, are, want to talk about um, what we're recommending to the board. We would like to, um, through an RFP process, um, really align services to risk and needs and make program improvements and, and prioritize our funding to evidence-based practices to achieve outcomes. So we would like to recommend that we return to your board in March um, with a, a draft of a, a request for proposals that we plan to put out, um, much as we've, similar to what we've done, of course, for uh, our realignment dollars uh, and similar to the core, and taking into consideration what we've learned from in the experiences in core and realignment. Um, I know there's always concern about the amount of work that our providers would have to do with applications, but we want to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, and I am confident many of the same providers will continue to, to be able to serve our youth. Um, so with that, um, that wraps up my presentation and um, I was wondering if there are any questions. Uh, 
Are there any brief questions from supervisors before we open it up? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. The, the, the ongoing work that we're doing with Results First, I think, is, is, is critical work. It lets us uh, uh, show the value of the investments that we make. I'm really glad to see CSAC as involved because um, I think this uh, should be a standard uh, in California. So uh, I'm glad that we were uh, uh, early adopters mm -hmm. of this. Um, I wonder if you could say something about the recidivism rate. Sure. Um, uh, the numbers here, I, I, I don't have any, I don't, I know the adult numbers slightly better, so I can't tell if these are um, uh, state average, better than the state average. What, what, what does this tell us? This is, um, and this is the first time we've done that. We did a six-year analysis of a cohort and looked at the recidivism rate for a period of six years. Um, and we know, so we determined that 33% reoffend. They have an adjudicated offense within the first year, and that's that's about normal. And uh, and are working with our um, technical assistance team. But what this does is establishes a baseline for us, which we just haven't had. Um, and I could say that of those that recidivate within the first year, uh, 70 about 70% are misdemeanor offenses, uh, and 30% are felony. Um, so that's while their misdemeanor is still um, obviously. Uh, a, a crime, um, I'm happy to report they're not felonies, you know, or person-to-person -person crimes. Uh, so, um, but we'll, we're gonna be able to compare ourselves as we move forward and we have the, the tool uh, and the inventory to the, determine this. How it compares to the adult uh, system is um, the last, it was about 32%, it's very similar within the first year. Sure. Um, but we wanna, clearly what we wanna do with this tool is, is reduce that, I mean, it would be remarkable, obviously the goal, the gold standard would be zero uh, recidivism, but we know even reducing it by 10% is, is very significant, sure. and there's a, a good return to the community, so that's what we're shooting for. Yeah, when we look at recidivism rates of adults, don't we usually look at it at a three-year uh, period instead of a six-year period? Why, yes. Why are we looking at it this This is the, uh, the you, you well, yeah. It? Yeah, so in terms of the way the model works, um, it, it, it does, um, our definition of recidivism um, and our kind of term is, is a little bit different than maybe the way a lot of states and counties generally look at recidivism rates generally in kind of a three-year um, section. And the reason for that is that the, the model wants to, um, uh, realize the benefits that occur over the long term. And so the longer the recidivism period that you look at, the longer the model is, is able to estimate the benefits of that program. So um, the longer, there are some states that have, that have looked at 10 um, in Washington State. Um, I think there are over 20 years now of looking at um, that same cohort over 20 years to see, um, again, um, what the benefits of these programs are as they accrue over time. And so um, the, other, the other thing I would note is that um, when it comes to um, juvenile versus adult recidivism costs is that um, you are looking at kids as they move from the juvenile to the adult system. So um, some of the benefits that accrue for those programs will be in the juvenile system because you will be avoiding um, some juvenile juvenile crime, um, but you're also looking at the benefits of avoiding some adult crime as well. And so that longer um, kind of period that you look at it means that you can kind of estimate the value of avoiding some of those things later down in the years. Yeah, and, and as I've looked, I think the CAP report looked at um, uh, uh, youth crime, and we've seen a downward trend over the past 15 years or something, mm -hmm. but this re recidivism rate, is this, do we have this number for other jurisdictions? Can, is 63% a good number, a, a, an average number? So uh, what I was gonna say is that actually um, Santa Cruz is the first results first county to be able to complete the juvenile justice work. Um, there is some, um, uh, the other counties that we're working with have all been focused on adult um, criminal justice and um, after working with Santa Cruz and seeing them do such an incredible job on the adult side, we thought um, that this would be a great county to move forward and look at the juvenile side. So I think we'll have more information about how this fits within um, uh, other counties in the state kind of as other counties start to take on the juvenile component of this and work. The, the, uh, the number, the cohort number is relatively small. Um, just uh, in January, we had, I think might have been our record lowest uh, average daily population in juvenile hall was 9.5 9 youth. So these, these, are, these are smaller numbers. Uh, and the, um, the individuals that we're serving, we, we divert 
about 65% of the youth that come into contact with our system, and that's some of the uh, local police departments have their own diversion programs. That's a good thing. We're responding differently. We're responding, but differently. So, the, but the individuals we are are getting now and supervising tend to have a, a really a combination of high high criminogenic needs and, and just high needs in areas of you know substance use uh, and mental health. So, and they, and they risk, according to our risk level, about moderate to high risk to recidivate. So, we're smalling, serving smaller numbers, but they are um, coming to us with more chronic issues. But that's how you know you should reserve your uh, resources. No, no, I, yeah. I, I totally agree with that. I just think it's it's hard. It was hard for me taking a look at this number um, yeah, because of our low incarceration rate, which has been mm -hmm. a, a almost 20 year effort, successful effort, I would argue, um, that, that, that those who end up in our juvenile justice, you know, in, in juvenile hall, are the people who are supposed to be there for the most part. And as you say, they might have higher criminogenic um, uh, needs or behaviors. And so, Th this might skew that number, and I'm j I was just, that's what I'm trying to get some sense and, about it. And the risk, you know, when you do this level of analysis, when no one else has done it, is you're the first out there showing this, this data. And but the importance of that, I think, is that we have a baseline we can look to, achievable to achieve a, a reduction in that. So um, that's sort of the the caution. Um, and so, and we want to make sure that when we compare ourselves to other counties, that we we're comparing apples to apples too. That tends to happen a lot. How do, how do we look? and then we determined that they were using a different me methodology, mm -hmm. but at least with the results first core ho mm -hmm. co cohort that uh, will have similar methodologies. Yeah, uh, the last thing I'll say is that uh, when I look at this cost of recidivism, my memory of from the adult, this is almost three times as much as, uh, as the cost of recidivism of adult, and so uh, we'd be wise to continue to putting our resources there because that's not only um, uh, uh, the best opportunity for us to to, uh, to help correct behavior or, or get support, but it's obviously gonna cost us a lot more in the long run. Yeah, the, the adult recidivism cost uh, uh, was $42,000 yeah. from the, the model. Yeah, so my memory is so as bad as I thought, but. <laughs> yeah, it's good, <laughs> pretty close. Impressive. And Thank I know there's, sir. sure, there's a brief question from Supervisor Caput, then we'll open it up to the community on this item. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for all you're doing. Uh, a quick question on gang uh, intervention with uh, youth and all that. About how much time is spent on that and maybe a quick description of how it's Great question. I, I really, I was, earlier I was talking to our team about, you know, when I, when I you know, uh, as a parent do provide supports for my, my children, um, they're very similar to what youth that are involved in gangs are, those, those uh, connections to adult role models, consistency, um, and, and uh, the, the support, educational support and so on. So all the programs that we utilize are, are have components. They don't necessarily call it gang intervention program because I'll tell you, most kids aren't gonna show up if they had a sign that said gang program. But what appeals to them are the pro-social activities, the connections with adults. So a lot of time is spent um, in activities and interventions that are gonna address the root causes of whether it's gang behavior or, or other types of delinquency, it's very similar. It's really, you know, our young people falling through the cracks, falling in, at school, not having, you know, connections to adults, the supervision, um, you know, socioeconomic conditions can contribute to that. So uh, I would say that most of our programs have components. While they don't say this is gang intervention, just because it would probably not be attractive to, to kids, they're, they're doing that. Uh, if let's say somebody has a record and they're some of it started when they were younger and then it maybe went over a little bit when they were ad an adult, um, they can do things to clean up their record. Uh, and do you, do you ever do recommendations like they want to join the military, for example, uh, but the military has their mm -hmm. you know standards also. Do, is there help for those that want to clean up the record and then go to Absolutely. Into the military? For juveniles, there's been a sweeping reforms, uh, particularly in the last couple of years, uh, uh, led by uh, Assemblymember Mark Stone, uh, around record sealing. So there's now, uh, that means your records are sealed, closed. Uh, and so before there was a process where the youth would have to petition the court. Now there's a lot of automatic record sealing. It's for those, those reasons, because we know 
um, this can haunt you for the rest of your life, having a record, having a felony, a misdemeanor. And of course, we also had um, Prop 47, which provided relief uh, for certain crimes uh, that could be reduced from felonies uh, to misdemeanors for a lot of individuals. So those types of reforms are helping people um, move beyond the label of and stigma attached to that. Uh, yeah. And so th that's, that's helping, but we could do a lot more, I, I, I know that. I thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Well, I would move the recommended actions and I'll express our appreciation. That. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Caput. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. <laughs> Thank you both very much Thank for you. that. We'll move on to the two pulled items from earlier today. We had item uh, 14, which became 55. Point one, item 14 is to accept and file the whistleblower hotline activity for 2017 as recommended uh, by the Auditor, Controller, Treasurer, Tax Collector. Ms. Steinbrenner, you pulled this item? <coughs> yes, I did. Thank you. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Um, I have uh, reservations about the effectiveness of this program, and I would like a discussion of its history what, what actions have come out of it. Um, I was interested to find out that all uh, whistleblower um, report, reports submitted are first reviewed by um, Ms. Driscoll's office. And so I would like to know, and, and I'm asking for, what criteria um, that office uses to determine whether a whistleblower report is uh, further investigated or, or how is the best way to handle it. I am concerned that if, and, and I, I read the report, that a number of things that were uh, whistleblower reports were referred then to the department for which the problem exists. And I don't think that we can really expect a thorough investigation maybe not even any investigation at all. And so I would like to ask how that has worked in the past. Is this a new program? What have been the results? What changes have come about? What courses of action were changed or to address these uh, whistleblower reports of waste, fraud, and um, problems? Um, and what sort of a follow-up report does Mr. Skull's office give to you in terms of action taken on, on the reports, whistleblower reports that were, have been submitted by the public? I will tell you that as a member of the public, um, many people think the grand jury is, you know, the way to go. But they are such, they have so much and uh, to do and uh, really limited resources that I'm grateful that there is another avenue, but I really question its effectiveness and I would like some discussion about that and what I've asked here. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address this on this item? All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, council, the, a question that was asked that I don't know the extent of the appropriateness of answering it, so I just wanted to ask you from a process uh, component what would be appropriate to convey on this process. So this is agendized as an annual report and I think these questions go far beyond the scope of what's been agendized and perhaps Ms. Steinbrunner could have a conversation with Ms. Driscoll. Okay. So I'll move approval. Second. There's, the point of uh, doing uh, there's a saying? motion and a second from Supervisor Coonerty and from Supervisor Leopold. Um, Ms. Driscoll, you'll commit to a conversation Certainly, with Certainly, and I'm happy to provide a, a little history if that's beneficial. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Move on to item uh, 55.2, which was pulled item 17. This is approved plans and specifications uh, for the Davenport Communications Tower installation project. Direct the GSD to advertise for bids, set the bid opening for 3 p.m. on March 6th, and then GSD and take other related actions as recommended by the Interim Director of, of General Services and the Director of Information Services. Ms. Steinbrenner, please. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, Raptos. <coughs> um, I'm, I'm interested in supporting uh, good public safety communication on the North Coast. Um, I'm a ham radio operator and I know that that area is problematic. 
and uh, the ham radio community, which provides emergency communication for the county and agencies, has solved that problem for us by having the Mount Toro machine and using the, the bay as a ground plane. And I didn't know until yesterday, and I talked with Ms. Uh, Tibby McCain, that that's also what this is. So it's a tower, like an 85-foot tower, um, and uh, there will be a, a microwave dish on it aimed over at Mount Toro. What I, what I take exception with as a citizen is that in the agenda it says the plans and specifications were available to the public at General Information Services. I did go there because I'm a radio operator and I'm interested in finding out what's there and they were not available. Um, I was sent to information technology and then that person sent me to the radio shop and that person sent me back to the information technology to talk with Ms. McCann and she was very helpful. I really want to thank her for that. My concerns, and I'm going to relay a couple for you from Marilyn Garrett because uh, she wanted to speak but it had already been pulled and you would not allow her to speak and she had to leave. Her. Um, my, my concern and hers also is that this tower could be, become a co-location for cell phone. And Ms. Garrett's understanding of the law, and she's studied this pretty well, is that if the um, cell phone companies come to the county and say, we want a place on that tower, by law you will not be able to refuse them. And so that opens up kind of a can of worms, but also the, the, the hazards of microwave technology, if, it, if it's been tested, if the area around there, the people have been notified. But what a big question I want to bring up here is that um, both Supervisor Friend and Coonerty, you are um, stockholders in a company called Predpol, Predatory Poli uh, Predictive Policing, that will benefit by this. Um, technology. And Supervisor Friend, you sit on a board and take money for doing so with yard arm technology, which relies on this kind of uh, communication, cell phone in particular. And I think the two of you need to recuse yourself from voting on this issue and any other issues regarding law enforcement communication or cell phone tower installations in the county, because that all supports what you are being uh, economically benefited by in your positions, and I would like uh, some discussion from you about that, and also from County Council, whether uh, co-location is any opportunity at all in the future. Is there anybody else that would like to address us on this item? Uh, if not, we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Chair. Uh, no. Sheriff Hart. Good afternoon, board. Jim Hart, County Sheriff. Just real quickly, uh, this, this radio tower is going to provide some much needed radio infrastructure on the north coast that we lack right now and sometimes we're not don't have the ability to communicate at all um, my office which is the uh, primary user of this uh, tower does not have a contact uh, contract with predpole or yard arm so there's no conflict uh, from the sheriff's office point of view uh, in this at all and it's really about getting radio communication to better serve the north coast thank you Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. You know, the issue of uh, public trust in elected officials is a serious one, and, and we should take it very seriously. But to, to, to make um, accusations against uh, elected officials based on the flimsiest chance that uh, an antenna might be used for something involving uh, law enforcement, and there's somebody who has a, 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 a business relationship with law enforcement is is a wildly uh, misinterpretation of co conflict of interest. And we have a responsibility um, to uh, listen to issues fairly, um, and uh, we, we take concerns seriously, but uh, to, to ca carelessly and callously accuse uh, elected officials of, of uh, not operating in the public interest and somehow having a conflict of interest on its flimsy uh, a connection as is here, I, I think is wrong. And, and, and uh, uh, I uh, trust that we, we all f fill out uh, uh, 700 forms so people know what our um, yes. um, That's uh, investments are. Uh, but you just, you just cannot just casually throw out that someone has a conflict of interest. I, I just think that that's inappropriate. I would move the recommended action. 
There's a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, it passes unanimously. Uh, we're gonna move into closed session. Will anything be reportable out of closed session? No. And that will then uh, conclude the meeting as we move into closed session.